What's cracking YouTube? I'm not gonna talk for too long because I don't wanna hijack the video. This is an interview I did with Casey Kasem. She is an up and coming content creator within the fantasy space. She does a podcast called the Get Real Podcast. She is a writer for the fantasy footballers and she asked me to come on to her podcast. It's a kind of behind the scenes look of different creators that she brings on in the space. And we talked about, I guess, my start, where the business is at and the brand and just nothing fantasy football related, nothing like NFL player related. So if y'all are here for that content, y'all can skip fast forward make sure you hit the fucking thumbs up button though i just want to give you a quick intro to let you know what this video was this was on her network this was on her podcast her and all that kind of stuff you can go follow her at the casey Kasem on twitter you can go subscribe to the get real podcast all of which i will link down below if you do enjoy the conversation make sure that you hit the thumbs up button make sure that you follow her make sure that you subscribe to both of our content shits i'll see y'all on the other side well i was really excited to get you on here because i knew of you but I'm, at least two people have brought you up already on this podcast so i thought well i might as well talk to the guy himself so <laughs> yeah <laughs> these are the my uh these are my favorite like types of shows to come on they're not you know they're kind of few and far between in our in our industry but like mm -hmm. whenever i jump onto a, a fantasy podcast uh, a, a lot of them now i guess kind of start off with 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 questions like in this kind of territory mm -hmm. um, i think that would be kind of cool if we just you know stuck with this topic for the entirety of the of the video or, or podcast and we never really went into fantasy football like i'd be totally down for that and sometimes yeah. i kind of string them along for like the hour we don't touch on any football players and i'm like this is beautiful let's just do this every time but other times we get sucked into fantasy football and i'm like okay i guess that's why i'm here right well it's nice to have a nice balance but yeah on here i just like talking because Everybody who I've gotten feedback from so far has been like, wow, it's really cool that I got to know somebody that I really don't know that much about because I've had, you know, Matt Harmon was on and I've had Andy Barons and, and Charch and everything. And it's like these bigger guys in the industry to be able to hear, you know, stories that you didn't know about and all this other stuff and how they came up just like, you know, you and me and everybody else. It's, it's pretty rad to hear. Yeah. It, you know, everyone, everyone uh, is coming up in different ways and it's it's fun to um talk to people in the industry that are from the younger generation from the older generation because mm -hmm. i think uh most of the people that we kind of look up to that are like the older heads in a sense of the generation kind of came through uh blogging and now podcasting and we're seeing a, a, a bunch of different like social platforms become kind of the mainstay or the ones that have the most like reach the most organic growth through them so it, it's been fun to see and operate through you know, seeing where people are going to start pivoting their their concentration and their attention to, you know, and some people are like stagnant. And they're like, ah, I like what I'm doing here. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, eventually that will play itself out in a couple of years. So it's fun to get a grasp of like where people have come from and, and where they plan on going in the future. For sure. I mean, the landscape is changing, like you said, and talking to the guys who had to have people call their answer machines and leave their lineups and all that stuff has been really rad because it's like, I mean, wow, you can have this be a long lasting you know, career, if you really, really put your all into it. And you haven't always been like focused on fantasy football. There's been a, obviously a life before fantasy football. <laughs> Can you go back to not even w work in general, but go back to your younger years when you started playing fantasy football? Exactly. How did you get started in all of that? Yeah, I think uh, I don't like know what made me start playing fantasy football it might it might have been i'm a falcons fan i live in new york i'm a falcons fan so like one of the most frequently asked questions like why are you a falcons fan and i was probably like 11 or 12 maybe when mike vick came in the league and he was obviously one of the most like polarizing figures and he had gotten me like addicted to football and just watching him in general he was like one of the coolest athletes had come around and you know in, in a long time so i had gotten so fond of like uh, of what he was doing I became such a fan of him that I became a fan of the Atlanta Falcons and this is could co co completely be like untrue but I probably got into fantasy football based on him and me and my friends started playing I remember we'd like ride bikes around our town all day and then we'd pop up at the library uh later on and we'd be like yo let's do some like fantasy football drafts we go on Yahoo and we do uh whether it was mock drafts or we join real drafts and stuff and now I think about it and you know how like when people do waiver wires nowadays and they're like, oh, this player is unowned in like 60% of Yahoo leagues. And you're mm -hmm. like, that's ridiculous. Like that player shouldn't be on the wire. I kind of start to think back of like when we were kids, it was because people like us who mm -hmm. would join 50 leagues when yeah. they're 12 years old and then they don't actually play the league out or anything. We just did it for the draft. I remember being like, yeah. I just want I just want Michael Vick. I just want Priest Holmes. I just want these guys on my team would do like one or two rounds of like a real league. 
mm-hmm. and then uh, let the thing fly. So started I probably when I was like 11, 12, 13, not really sure um, why I got into it, to be honest. And then from there, it's we had like one real um, league that we were that me and my friends from middle school, high school were really into. And we still mm-hmm. one of the shows that we put out weekly is is like following along and documenting that entire league. And uh, that league has kind of grown in a, in and of itself. And I like thought when I was younger, I was like, oh, I'm really I won like three of the first five years. And I was like, yeah, I'm like good at fantasy football. Let me like start um, helping people out or whatever. So I started doing my own blog and and things have that was, you know, probably started like 10 years ago and things have kind of, of evolved since then. But that's the quick like, you know, fantasy football s- starting point of it all, I guess. So you're talking about how you like the draft portion of it. Are you a fan of DFS or best ball or both? So, um, DFS, I don't play DFS at all. Uh, I, to be honest with you, like I, I really enjoy season long still. Me and my friends Mm -hmm. were actually having this conversation yesterday. I'm like, dude, I'm still, you know, even as we're putting out a lot more dynasty content and I'm in a bunch of dynasty leagues myself and it's become like a game that I actually really enjoy. I am still like really, really excited about season long. I still think it's like the reason I play fantasy football because of the engagement within season long leagues and, and yeah. like what surrounds that the actual product mm-hmm. of what season long is. I don't play DFS. Uh, it just, I, you know what it is? Like, I don't know. I, I just, I'm not in this for, it's probably saying this the wrong way, but like I've, DFS is like, it is really gambling when you think about it. Like, I don't care about like the whole like government and whatever the thing. You know, <laughs> we, we can curse on here, right? Yeah, you can do whatever you okay, want. Yeah, I don't, really, I don't give a fuck like what like people break down the government versus whatever it is. I'm just like, I don't know. DFS doesn't really, doesn't really excite me because you're getting into it to like try to make money. And it's like, yeah. dude, uh, the best players in DFS might, might win like 55% of the time. But at the end of the day, like your algorithm is not better than this person's lineup DFS optimizer. And I'm just like, dude, it's, I feel like it's like a bunch of bullshit just being sold in that industry. And I'm just like, I'm not, a, it's not fun for me. So I'm not really about it, you know? No, I totally get that as well. Like <laughs> there's certain types of leagues that I'm just not a fan of as well. So I've, I've tried to do a, a little bit more DFS this season just because I've been bored and at home. Um, but I think in a normal, you know, year, I'm not doing as much. I'm not winning any money anyway. So I'm just kind of, yeah. you, know? you know, like, I'm just like, does it actually take any skill to win DFS or like, are the people that are willing to mil- winning the Millie makers, like just putting in a lucky lineup. And I'm just, I'm just like, I don't know. People, you mm-hmm. waste so much time like diving into DFS and those numbers and stuff. I'm like, I really kind of feel not that it's a waste of time if you enjoy doing it, but yeah. the way people hype it up to be in this industry where it's like this money making machine and there's really like edges to be had here. I'm just like, I don't, I don't really buy into that shit. It's it, it's not really me. I mean, you know, it's not right. everything's not for everybody, obviously, but that's exactly just not- yeah. I mean, I had TJ Hernandez on here and he's a big DFS guy. And I mean, he used to play poker, online poker before that was shut down. Then he switched over to DFS. Um, so, you know, and, and he enjoys it and, you know, it gets him enough money. So more power to him as well. You yeah. know, <laughs> people, everybody people who could like make an actual living off DFS. Yeah. Although I don't think I believe most of the people that say they make a living off DFS, but if you can, that's like wildly impressive to me. And there yeah. is probably some kind of connect between like poker players and DFS players. They probably come from some kind of like natural same, <laughs> I don't know, consciousness or whatever, you know, that yeah. that's a game that I think is tantalizing to probably both of those parties. So there's probably yeah. way more credit to be given there than I'm, than I'm giving to it, but just, I don't know, I guess not my cup of tea. Well, that kind of trans transitions me to this question about talking about YouTube, which seems like it doesn't have anything to do with that, but it does because the, cool. the transition here is the reason he started playing. Um, the reason he started playing the doing DFS instead of playing poker is because poker got shut down. So he didn't have that source of revenue anymore. He didn't have that thing to go to. And, and now YouTube, I hear a lot of YouTubers complain about monetization and, and all of that, you know, how YouTube is changing and, and all of these things. You think it's going to become a thing where one day YouTube isn't going to be pulling in as many people as it is at the moment? Um, so, wait, uh, what do you mean? Like YouTube is going to be... like it, Not that it's going to go away, but do you think that there's going to be something else that comes and like takes over and takes... It's it's a good question. I I feel like, and it might be a naive answer because I'm probably biased towards YouTube because that's kind of right. like where I built my platform right. from. But YouTube feels like very powerful in a sense that it really has a, a, a grasp on long form video content, right? Like mm-hmm. these other platforms where it's like you know Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, 
Twitter, they're all kind of fighting with each other for video content because they all have a limit of like a minute, two minutes, whatever. Right. And you're, you're, start, you're slowly starting to see like Instagram, you know, they're letting you upload IGTVs that are 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. And Twitter, oh. like it, you, sometimes you can get an upload length kind of extended there. But like YouTube is long form video, you know, like mm -hmm. there isn't a platform that's actually competing with them. So for now, like maybe five years down the line, they will have a, a competitor there. But I feel like YouTube's in a really, really good spot as far as where they fit into the ecosystem of, of video. Yeah, I've been watching a lot more YouTube channels than normal. Um, I'm not supposed to have my phone on at work. And that's why podcasts are pretty easy to listen to. But um, yeah, the YouTube, I know like the fantasy footballers, they're in the YouTube game. And there's a lot of new channels that have popped up recently. Why do you think we'll get to you in YouTube in general in a minute? But why do you think that YouTube took hold of fantasy football so quickly and really ran with it? Uh, because that's just where people are. I mean, that's where the organic growth is. Like fantasy football exploded on, on Twitter, yeah. but people aren't really on Twitter anymore. Like, I mean, there obviously are a lot of people on Twitter, but you can't really organically find many people on, on Twitter through industries like this, unless you're like really actively searching for it. There's just not, you know, you go onto like a podcast, you go onto iTunes podcast or whatever, you're not really organically finding anybody. Like their search system is not good. It's like whoever is at the top ranked part of, of these uh, fantasy or, you know, niche podcast avenues, like those are the people that are going to stay there. It's, it's not good for growing, but YouTube is, I mean, at the end of the day, YouTube is owned by Google, right? There are certain yeah. platforms. So it's like, they want to give you what you're looking for. And if you type in fantasy mm -hmm. football, you're going to come across a bunch of different channels and like people go onto YouTube searching for these things. Like you don't go onto Twitter searching for new information. You kind of just go there to like mindlessly scroll, but you go on YouTube and you're looking for like fantasy football rankings, fantasy football, this or whatever, they're going to give you a bunch of options. And there's just so many people there at all times. And on the flip side, it's like a supplier a supply and demand thing. So for a long time, there weren't a lot of fantasy football creators, content creators. So it's like you have this influx of this industry that's getting wildly popular at a, at a crazy, crazy pace. And you have people, the audience getting really, really big looking for content to consume. And then you have this giant platform in YouTube where there's like five creators on it. So you got people jumping on there. You got 5 million people looking for content. You've got five people making content. You do the math. Those people are going to grow really, really quickly. So that's why, I mean, YouTube just, it, the, the search is still, that's why you're seeing all the brands make YouTube like a mm -hmm. very, very big pillar of their content now because you're just seeing the organic reach like the organic search the the organic traffic and volume that you're getting in subscribers and stuff is yeah. getting noticed by the big brands so they all start to pivot over there eventually it'll get too saturated and we're all going to need to find a new platform to do that with you know yeah as most jobs you know <laughs> people get yeah. you know pushed out all the time um my question to go with youtube with the algorithm of youtube and how you guys will pop up like the suggested videos or whatever, because you watch this channel, people watch this channel. How exactly does that work? You know, uh, for someone that like really likes YouTube and does a lot of YouTube <laughs> stuff, I don't focus myself on, on like those types of tactics. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't want to say gimmicks cause they're obviously important. I, I right. focus on like making stuff that I really enjoy making, like making content that I like have fun doing and, and mm -hmm. like, the thumbnails really important. Obviously the titles are important, but I can't really sit here and tell you like this works better than this, or mm -hmm. this works like that because of X, Y, Z. I think one of the things that I've uh, found really helpful is like looking at other channels. Like I'm not, I'm not like too, you know, into myself to be like, Oh, like this fantasy football channel is really good at doing thumbnails. Like what is it about their thumbnail that I think attracts people or what, what do I personally like about it? Like, why is this video per se, doing really big numbers uh, as opposed to this one. I'm like, oh, the title is like really intriguing. Let me try to do like a playoff or a spinoff of that. So I think it's a little bit of like doing your own research. Uh, the algorithm kind of works in its own right. And I, I really just don't like, I don't like to spend time or energy on, on shit that I feel like I'm never really going to be able to figure out anyways. You know, I feel like you do the right <laughs> thing. You have good intent, you work hard and like the, the, the results will come at the end of it. For sure. And if you put in the work, I mean, you're going to show up in people's algorithms all over the place. So exactly. you're going to get more viewers that way as well. So before you started doing your fantasy football content, what were you doing for a living? How were you living your, you know, every day, got to go to work kind of life? So I, I want to say I might, I, I want to say I started fantasy football blogging, like while I was still in college, maybe. 
um, or maybe like right after I left college. And the first job I had was at a typical like business entry level position. I'd gone to school undergrad for for business stuff. And uh, the first business job I think I was I had was like very administrative, like lower level stuff that wasn't, you know, creative or whatever. And I, I jumped around a few full time jobs by the time I was like 22 or 23, like right out of college. I just like there was a lot of shit that I didn't like. I was just like, ah, this is not for me. It's not going to be long term. I want more. I want more. I didn't know what I wanted, but I wanted more. And I eventually landed at a marketing agency. Uh, I, I grew up in New Jersey and the, and the agency was a, a couple miles away from where I lived in New Jersey. And I was there for probably like eight months and I had gotten into like a more creative role there. And I was like, oh, this is this is like really, you know, this is intriguing to me. Like this is fun, the marketing side of things, because this is when um, this is probably like six, seven ish years ago when Facebook and Instagram were just getting on the map in terms of like uh, sponsored posts and like really social media becoming a big priority of, of companies and brands and stuff. So I had kind of been put on a team where I was running like Facebook ads, you know, the sponsored posts going down your feed and stuff for some of the clients at the marketing agency. And I had like absolutely no fucking idea what I was doing on those campaigns. I was like very young and they're like, we want you to run these. And I was like, okay, like I get it. Like I'm on Facebook, but I don't really know anything about campaign spending. I don't know about like targeting on those platforms. I don't know anything at this point. So I was doing that. I was in marketing, right? That that had always been my passion. That will always be my passion. Um, but I had started blogging fantasy stuff I realized quickly that I'm like, I don't like writing. I'm not, I'm not a big yeah. writer. Yeah. Uh, and I started doing video. And again, that was not like from a, that was not from basically, you know, to where I started this video off with where I was talking about like, or this, this podcast off with, you know, there was not a lot of content creators on YouTube. That was not my mindset. My mindset was legitimately like, I'm better on video. I'm better on camera. I'm better uh, on audio recording myself. Um, so I'm just going to switch to a video platform. And the only one I knew at the time was YouTube. I was like, oh, it's kind of cool that no one's really uh, no one's really posting on here. So like the organic growth, although I wasn't taking it seriously and I was doing it like really, really, um, you know, one video here and a video a month from now is like, oh, I'd have like 500 subscribers by the end of the summer. And I'm like, that's, that's ridiculous for the amount of work that I'm not putting in. So I had been doing some of the organic stuff, like my videos, but I was working in the marketing field. Mm -hmm. Um, I eventually jumped over to an agency in New York city. And by that point, things had started to scale up a little bit. I was writing for some uh, different blogs. I was posting video content more regularly. And I had gotten to the point where I want to say like I had not like a ton of subscribers, maybe like five ish, 5,000 ish subscribers. And I started to like use some of the tactics that I had learned, like in the real marketing world, you know, at this point mm -hmm. I had been in it for like two or three years. And I started to like monetize some of the things that I was doing and the organic growth continued to go. The, the more work I put into it, the more growth we had. And I was like, yo, this is kind of like a gold mine right now. Like there are still, these companies and brands are still not hopping onto YouTube. So I have probably this two to, I mean, I have videos probably saying this two to three years ago. I'm like, there's a two to three year window that I'm going to have to be able to put out as much content as I want before all the brands start like hopping in. So I did that. I worked really hard. And uh, eventually the last agency I was at, I found myself like, sitting in the kitchen of the marketing agency, like on my laptop, away from everybody, just working on my own shit. I was like, yeah. oh, working on my website, like doing blog posts, like doing my own stuff. And I was like, this is ridiculous that I'm sitting here eight hours a day working on somebody else's shit when I want to do my own stuff. So right. I eventually, uh, I remember like I called my best friend. I was commuting home from work one day. I was like, yeah, I think I'm going to leave my job in like two to three months and like really just chase after whatever. And at the time I didn't really have a plan. I was like, I don't know what I'm gonna do. You know, I had, I, I knew that this would work, but I didn't know like how or how long it would take or whatever. Like mm -hmm. I'm gonna leave my job in like two to three months probably. Cause it, it was there, there was, there was just, I was like suffocating at the job. I was like, I know what I want. I know what I wanna chase after. I'm super passionate about this. I'm gonna leave. And like mm -hmm. the next day I just walked in and I was like, I'm out. Like I didn't wait the two to three months. I walked right into my boss's <laughs> office. I was like. I'm sorry. Like, I love you guys. Like, this has been a really fun experience. I love marketing, but like, I got to do my own thing. It was cool. <laughs> my, you know, my boss was like, super supportive of it. Uh, I left and I had basically what I had done. I, I took my experience in the marketing world doing Facebook and Instagram sponsored campaigns. And that was how I would make money for the next year or two years. Um, running those campaigns for like small, medium sized businesses that mm -hmm. needed them, uh, you know, needed them done, but didn't know how to do it themselves. So that freed up flexibility. I didn't have to commute into Manhattan, you know, every day I didn't have to do all this other shit with work. So it freed up flexibility, it freed up uh, time, it freed up a lot of things for me to be more creative on the content side of things. So chasing after the content while doing like freelancing marketing 
on the side. So money was not really coming in through fantasy yet. And uh, I just kind of had to keep running it out until like the two worlds collided and content could kind of take over the entirety of, of what I was doing. And that's totally dope. Um, I know that on your YouTube channel, you've got old videos from back when you first started, when you were kind of showing the process that you went through in order to get where you are now. Um, why did you think it was important to document that and show that to everybody that was subscribed to your channel or that just like hopped in because of the <laughs> random algorithm um you know I, I still think about that to this day like I, I i don't know i think i did it for a few reasons i think i did it for myself one maybe to hold myself accountable i did it for uh i i think i just always believed in what i was doing like really really wholeheartedly and i was like this mm -hmm. would be really just cool to document like me being able to look back five years from now and being like this is where i started like this mm -hmm. is how i did it and um and i think i also did it because i wanted people to know that you know you could completely be yourself and also be successful like we've had right. luckily like in the last like three five years we've had this like big wave in terms of like content creation that like people yeah. are being way more open and transparent and like truthful and authentic to, to like who they are and that inspires right. people right like when you right. see people like you and me like being their true authentic like i can curse on here and it's For not sure. a big, yeah. you know, yeah. it, it's not a big deal like you see that and exactly. you're like oh like i'm like that person and that person mm -hmm. is successful. So I can yep. also be myself and be successful. So I, I kind of saw myself as like the person I needed to see when I was growing up. Like I wish yeah. I had seen, you know, like I, I, when I'm 18, I wish I had seen like 28 year old Nick, like telling yeah. me that it's okay to do X, Y, Z. It's okay to fuck up. It's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to do all these things that would make my life a lot easier. So I, I, it's a combination of shit that I feel like was just super important. And it's just something I, I felt like I needed needed to do. I don't really know why, I, I guess. No, I mean, that's totally cool because you see guys like, you know, Mike from the Fantasy Footballers or you see mm -hmm. uh, Matthew Har or Matt Harmon, who's just, you know, him being himself and stuff. And you're like, wow, that's just like a normal dude. So, yeah, yeah. I totally get that. Like, you want to see that representation. You want to be able to be like, I can relate to that person. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's really cool to see you grow how you've grown, grown and then be where you are and be like, that's just a, a normal dude. So. Yeah. Yeah. I think like really a lot of my audience too is, is like 20, actually I, I, it's really <laughs> weird. I have like a, an uncomfortable amount of like 16 to 22 year old guys in my audience that call me dad. And I'm just like, I, I don't know where I, I must've said something. Oh man. <laughs> made some kind of fucking comment in one of my videos one time. And like, they just don't stop. Like, they're just like, good, good morning, dad. Like every fucking comment is something like that. But I have a lot of kids that are um, that are like the age that I was when I started this stuff. So, you know, I want them to, uh, to understand that one, it's good to be yourself, but like also yeah. like let you know that I'm putting the fucking work in and I've been doing it for like seven, seven years. Like this shit mm -hmm. is not, not overnight, you know? So it, it's just like, a, it, it's like, I guess it's an inspirational thing, but the, the point was not really to be inspirational. It was just to show, you know, what it actually takes. Yeah. And it is freaking in inspirational because of, the age that you are, the age that you were when you started doing all this stuff. Most people your age aren't really that focused on the business aspect of, you know, wanting to start something from the ground up and this focusing on that, putting in the time and the effort. What made you decide that big dogs got to eat was going to be something that you wanted to put your focus on? Um, it would, I, it wasn't, there wasn't like a, a click factor. There wasn't anything that was like, I'm going to start a business today, uh, or this is what I'm going to chase after. It was a, it was a gradual thing over like years of, of testing things out of being like, this is, you know, something, something I, I, I tend to say a lot is like you figure out what you don't like way quicker than like what you do actually want. Because like, we're told from a young age that you have to kind of know, you know, what you want, uh, where your life is going to go, pick your major, pick your job when you're this old, but it's way easier to eliminate shit. It's like when you're 16, just tell me what you don't like. And we can start mm -hmm. putting you down the right path of shit that like might be, you know, in, in your, in your batter's box, you know? So I think mm -hmm. like, I just did a lot of shit when I was young. Like if, again, going back to the different jobs I had, if I was at a job full time, I like, I don't care if I signed a two year contract, if I hated it by the third week, like I'm out of there, you know, it's, it's not doing anyone a, a favor for me to stay work at a place that I hate the employer yeah. of. And, you know, just, it's just bad negative energy from both sides. So it's like, it, it's, it's this, um, combination of, of figuring out what you don't like really quickly. And then eventually like, it'll naturally, I think kind of, 
your world will come into focus when you start putting your energy towards things you like. Uh, and that's, that's what, like what I'm doing right now is a collection of, of filtering out shit I don't like. And I eventually kind of found my pitch with, uh, content creation. I think that like, um, the vlogging stuff and, and video, it, this was just one of the, the ways that I found myself most comfortably expressing myself. You know, I was not like someone that was very good, uh, expressing myself, like growing up and like really being vulnerable. But for some reason, like when I turn on the cameras, I'm just like, good to go all the time. You know, I'm like very open about shit and I yeah. don't have trouble um, doing that. And and that just felt so natural to me. And I'm like, this is probably what I'm going to be doing, you know, forever. And uh, with big dogs, it's like, again, it wasn't like a black or white thing where it's like, okay, we're a business now. We're not a business now. We're not, we're not, we don't box ourselves in like tomorrow. Right. I might stop doing fucking videos because I don't, because I don't feel like doing it. You know what I mean? I don't know. I don't know. It's just a, it's a whole bunch of combination of shit. I don't like and, and do like kind of joining forces. And you were talking about like maybe tomorrow you're not going to do fantasy. Is that why you decided that on your YouTube channel you were going to go by your name and not fantasy football channel or whatever else? Hundred percent. Yeah, I, I think uh, <clears throat> I think that that is definitely the reasoning why. And I think one of the biggest mistakes a lot of people, specifically in fantasy, do is is they box themselves into uh, what they think they should be or you know, the content that they think they should be making, which I think is a huge mistake. Um, not, not necessarily from like a content or a, like a branding perspective, but for a mental thing, like once you put yourself in, in your own box of like, uh, oh, I have to do this or I have to do this, you really fuck yourself uh, in the long run. You really do because then you have this, uh, built up, like you're going to burn out because you're right. like, Oh, I want to do this, but I have to keep pushing myself to do shit that, I promised myself to do a year ago, but I don't enjoy doing it anymore, you know? So uh, the brand the, the brand that I, I want to say that we're building right now, I like to call it a lifestyle brand in the sense that like anything that I'm passionate about in life mm -hmm. will be in my content, you know? Like mm -hmm. I don't care if it's so far out of what you're used to seeing on my channel or from me, but that's the stuff that if I enjoy doing it, like that's what yeah. you're going to get from me. So if you enjoy like the passion that you're getting from me from fantasy, you're probably going to enjoy it in marketing and, and business and branding and, and nutrition and fitness and tech and whatever the fuck I end up wanting to put out on, on, <laughs> on the video. You know what I mean? So um, I think, yeah, I, I think that's a big, big mistake of of, of people um, because it hurts them personally because they put themselves in a box and then they feel like they can't do what makes them happy. And doing a YouTube channel and using your name, it's probably easier to do that than it is, uh, you know, if you were writing for a fantasy football site. So it's sorry. it's been a little bit. No, no, it's okay. I, I think I know where you're going with that. Yeah, I think you know, it's been a little bit difficult as we're growing because we're starting to build a little bit of a team. Like I have, you know, right. four or five other content creators. We have a couple like editors and things like that. And with my name on it, it's like yeah. the company's name or the brand's name is not Nick Ercolano, obviously. It's, right. you know, Big Dog's Gotta Eat. And when people search that, like that's my name comes up. And it's like, okay, right. if we want to expand, I obviously know I can't do this all by myself. And right. uh, that was a big focus this year. So uh, a couple of the shows that we do on my channel, we, we did branch off and I gave – like uh, I do a video with two of my friends on Wednesdays and right. two uh, another video with two separate friends on Thursdays. And I'm like, yo, I want to pivot off and and kind of like create our own like podcast network in a sense. Like everything is under big dogs still. Like anything yeah. we put out, whether it's a different podcast or a new video channel or whatever. Uh, but we made separate YouTube channels for those. And we made separate podcasts for those because it did, like as you start to scale, it gets a little bit difficult with the, uh, with the name being the brand and everything. Mm -hmm. um, so- that, that has been something that I've kind of wrestled with and like had to navigate and figure out like kind of what I'm doing here. So I, I'm definitely not an expert on it by any means, but like I'm, you know, I'm trying my best to try to figure out the the avenues that way. Well, that's kind of why I decided to use my name when I was doing this. Hold on. It's all good. Gonna, I will edit this, but I'm getting a lot of echo. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Is that grab a water real quick. Cool. <laughs> I will edit this now, but... Maybe this is easier without the headphones. You can still hear me, right? Mm -hmm. I'm getting it either way. I don't know what's going on. Um, let me put them back in because I can hear you better that way. Sheesh. Are you getting echo <laughs> like my voice echo? No, your your voice doesn't echo. Maybe, but it just started happening. I'm gonna turn it down a little. There. Okay. I still hear an echo, but it's a little bit better. 
and it's gone. All right. <laughs> we're live, um, baby. We're live. Sorry about that. That was intermission because, you know, <laughs> we might go a while. Oh, no, I don't usually go. I do go. That's, you got my you got my complete well, time, focus, attention dope. and energy. And and I appreciate that. Do you that brings me to this kind of do you think that when you're putting out a podcast or you're doing like a video or whatever, that there should be a time frame that you like say, hey, this is good enough. You know, you don't want to go too much because people aren't going to listen to it or whatever. Or do you think that you can keep going because you've got an audience so they're going to listen to what you have to say? Yeah, that 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 actually goes right back to kind of the last question or the two out of whatever it is about putting yourself in that box yeah, is sure. like whatever I feel most comfortable with, like whatever I want to do. I get tons of comments. When I first started my YouTube channel, my videos were almost like 60 minutes long. Uh, so they would go for a long time. And it was just me doing solo videos. So I'd be talking forever. And it's still to this day, like I've cut them down pretty significantly, probably because I have more on my plate. So I don't really have time to do 60 minute videos anymore and the research. Right. Stuff. But I get a lot of comments still like cut these videos down to like to four minutes to six minutes. No one wants to watch a 30 minute video. I'm like, I'll just comment under. I'll be like, fuck off. Like, you know, yeah, like, right? I don't care. Like I do what I want, whatever feels right. most comfortable to me. And I'm not like, I can't like do analysis on a player and just do it in like two minutes. Like I need to be able to break down, you know, the way I break it down. So I don't, that's another thing, like going back to the algorithms, like people think they know it's like, oh, this is best, <laughs> this is best for this. I'm just like, I'm just going to put out the the content that, that's best from me and that I think I did the best on and what's most comfortable for me. So like length, I, there's never a, there's never been a piece of content I put out. That's like, Oh, we need to focus on like this being shorter or longer, unless obviously like the platform itself has a time constraint. Yeah. I mean, exactly. And if, if they're fans, quote unquote fans of yours, you know, your following is going to listen, right. you know, sometimes people, you know, fast forward or put it on, one and a half speed or whatever, but they're going to, they're going to see what they want and, and you're going to get that fan base to come over. But yeah, um, if you got like true fans, yeah. they'll, they'll listen to your shit for like six hours. Like you, you know, for people real. binge content all the time. It doesn't matter if it's one episode or six episodes. It's like, if they like what you're doing. If you're a good content creator, they're going to come around for the forever, you know? That's exactly right. And I wanted to go back. I wanted to touch just briefly, or we can just talk about it forever because this is a really interesting <laughs> question to, for me, but it has to do with the name of your brand. How did that come across, uh, come about? Because I was talking with Peter Howard on one of the episodes earlier and he was talking about it and he's like, I really don't know what it stands for exactly <laughs> or what it means. So yeah. Um, so <laughs> big dog's got to eat. This is, uh, this, this was, comes from my time in college. So we had at the end of my four years at college, we had what we had uh, called senior week. It was the last week of college where we had uh, graduation was at the end of it. So I think we had graduation on like Friday, but the days leading up to it were like organized by the senior class. And it was like one day of uh, a beer Olympics, one day of a bar crawl, one day of like a house party crawl, like typical like college nonsense shit, right? For the week. Right. And we had a uh, the beer Olympics, was this huge beer Olympics where you had a team of like seven or eight people. And, um, and my team, it was, I think 84 teams competed in the beer Olympics and we ended up getting down to the finals. So we were like the last two teams left of the 84. And at this point we're like, you know, we're fucked up. We're wasted. We're just like chugging beers down the line and shit. And we had the, this, the last game we played was a boat race. So you get like your five best people at chugging, the other team's five best people at chugging. For some reason, like I was really good at chugging beers in college. So they put me at the anchor and I was the last person in the beer race and we're like competing in the finals and it gets down to me and I, we beat the other team. I chugged the beer faster than whoever the anchor was. And like, for some reason, when I put my beer down, like I yelled out, like big dogs got to eat. Like that was, <laughs> that was like a phrase, right? And yeah, like my right? whole team started yelling started yelling excuse me <coughs> so we were like big dogs gotta eat we, were, hoo, hoo, hoo. we started like doing it. it became like our slogan for the day after we just won oh. this like 84 team beer olympics <laughs> and i thought about that and like at that time i hadn't started doing like content creation or anything like that yeah but it was just like a really good memory in my mind and when i when the time came when i had to think of like what i wanted to name this brand or what i wanted to do with it um you know there's all like the roto worlds and the fantasy football, this and and all that yeah. kind of shit that I feel like kind of falls into the same bubble. So I was thinking of names. I was like, what kind of encapsulates what I want people to take away or think of with this brand. And when I think of big dogs got to eat, like that was the first thing that popped in my head. I'm like, Oh, this is kind of like a funny personal anecdote. Like this is something that I think about and like have a good personal experience when I think about the name. But also when I think of like big dogs, 
I, I'm I'm thinking of the people that uh want more, want like right. that are not afraid to like chase after their passions and 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 work hard at things that are a little bit outside of the box. Mm -hmm. Right. And when I say like big dogs, like those are the people I'm thinking of, the ones that are that are okay taking the step, whether it's outside of the norm or like really putting themselves out there and being vulnerable. And got to eat. The second part is just like those people are the ones that are going to succeed, right? Those are the people that are going to yeah. get more out of life. So when I say big dogs got to eat, it's it's kind of from like a business sense, but it's kind of from like a, a, a sense of like fuckery as well. So there's multiple parts to it, but that's that's kind of where it comes from. And how important is it to have a, you know, have a name that is, sets yourself apart from all the other places? Because like I write for a site called Fighting Chance, and it's a fantasy football website. It's fantasy sports, but like. It's cool because if you were to open it up to other stuff, you could. So how important is it to have that? So it's like, is it Roto World or is it Roto whatever or Roto um, whatever? I, I, I guess I can't say it's that important because you could okay. look at many, you could, you could look at many, it's only important if it's important to you. That's, right. the, I guess that's the way I would put it. Cause you could look at like another site, okay. you know, the fantasy footballers, right? Yeah. Like there, that is the, the a very generic like that is anyone could have thought of that name but that is like the name now and they are right. wildly successful so like who am i to sit here and be like that's stupid you know what i mean because they've been yeah. so fucking good with branding it and making it yeah. their thing and making it a huge thing so like i think it's as important as you want it to be you know right i i, I didn't actually think of it that way, but that is a, a really awesome point. And how important do you think a logo is? So, because I know that the fantasy footballers have a really cool logo, and I know that your logo is one where I saw it and I was like, "Holy crap, that's like so beautiful." Do you like it? It's oh I, my gosh, I love it. Really, I kind of think it's like a piece of shit logo, but I love that. To me, really? it's endearing. Yeah, it's I like, like endearing to me. I like something like that that's minimalistic, gets to the point, but it's like. Still, there's a creativity in there, and you can see that. So, so the know. the importance of the logo to me is like m completely honest. I I think it doesn't matter at all. I think, <laughs> I think whatever lo I think the story you tell of of what you are, your your brand and and your content, like yeah. the consistency and the work that you put in over the years, mm -hmm. is what's gonna have the meaning behind the logo. You know, the logo itself. Yeah. I think logos. I think like websites, I think you know, business cards, technology, all this shit is a waste of time for most people starting off. I think mm -hmm. they use it as like excuses for why they're not creating and why they're not moving quickly and, and X, Y, Z. So those kind of things I don't necessarily think are important whatsoever. I think they're like important looking back, like because people will know what you are based on that. But at, mm -hmm. the, but at the beginning, which, which is what I think people get wrong, they think it matters from the start. It doesn't. It only matters when when you don't think it matters anymore, if that makes sense. No, that totally makes sense. You know, I'm, I'm learning here because I don't own my own anything. So <laughs> I'm kind of just, you know, here. But I know that um, some people feel like if you're trying to brand yourself, that if you want to put out merchandise, because a lot, I see a lot of fantasy football podcast websites putting out merch now and i i know that's one of the revenues especially during you know covid and everything else to help help out with that but um do you think that merchandise if, if you get to a point where you have a big following that merchandise is a road that you should look at yes and yes i would say for here's the thing like fantasy is an interesting space there are a lot of content creators yeah. uh I would say YouTubers in general, people that use like their physical appearance as some kind of value mm -hmm. prop to the audience, make a ton on merch. Like that's their, you know, if it really goes, what I think it goes to is um, what what's the value prop you're giving off to yeah. your audience, right? In fantasy football, most people's value props, 99.9% .9 of the people in the industry's value props is informational, right? Yep. Like people follow you for fantasy information. Yep. If you're someone who, uh, like for instance, like barstool sports, right? People mm -hmm. follow them. I like this is not like a, oh, I love them. You need to love their content or whatever. People follow them because they could be entertaining to their niche, right? Their value prop is entertainment. It's not information. People aren't like, oh, I need to know what the news is saying. Like, I need information. If your value prop is entertainment, I think merch is probably the single best like monetization source for you. We're in an industry where like information is the value prop. Thus, you see most companies monetizing through an information product. Most people aren't dying to buy your merch. It's a cool thing for people to have your merch, but even as someone, I consider like our, my brand to be like one of the stronger ones on the side of like, uh, I guess like entertainment value in a sense. I don't, I don't mean to sound like, you know, like narcissistic or cocky in that sense, but like kind of separating through, through video content is like a different style in our industry. And even like merch is not a huge piece of, of our, you know, monetization 
style. So I, it's very difficult to monetize. L long winded way of saying it's very difficult to monetize <laughs> in the fantasy industry because yeah. the value prop we give off is not to like support us through clothing and, and like our and and in our uh, aesthetic style. Oh, and that makes sense as well. And another thing I haven't had to deal with yet. So yeah, it, it's it's fun to like start off with it, but yeah. it, it, you know, it's it's one of those things where. A lot of people get excited at the forefront. Then you actually get into like the logistics of it mm -hmm. and and physically selling merch and like, oh, do I buy all the t-shirts up front? Do I have to find yeah. a manufacturer? Do I have to use drop shippers? There's a lot of shit that goes on behind the scenes that mm -hmm. once you get into it, you're like, it's usually not even fucking worth the hassle of, of actually selling them. And I had heard you say something about, I don't know where I heard it. You could probably refresh my memory, but you were talking about how when people say, yeah, I'm going to buy one of your shirts or yeah, you know, I, I will buy it. You know, th that's cool. You know, I'm going to get one of those totally. Like how yeah, do you bullshit. feel about that kind of stuff? Always bullshit. Always bullshit. <laughs> Always bullshit. Now, I, I mean, that's just like life in general. Yeah. I, I hold no like ill will towards people who do that shit. It's their money. It's their time. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you don't have to do anything if you don't want to. Uh, that's just like my practical business mind at this point. Like I've been, yeah. I've been selling merch for probably like five years and people are like, Oh, I can't wait to buy that shirt. And like 99% of the time it just doesn't happen. And it's like, yeah. I'm not going to waste my like energy or emotion on whether or not this one person buys a shirt. So it's another right. one of those things. Like when you start a new venture and like you're, you're doing the podcast right now, like yeah. including merch within your content or your brand is like a new venture in itself. Mm -hmm. You get, you start to get excited about it really quickly. And then the practical side of shit comes in. The realism comes in that every podcast is not going to get 100,000 downloads. Every yeah. t-shirt you put out is not going to make 1,000 sales. Things start getting real and your brain starts to like adapt to that. And you start to say, okay, I'm going to start this new venture. It's going to be really exciting at first. And then the work comes in that I have to do steadily for like the next two to three years to make sure that that realism of the sales matches like my excitement from the beginning of the venture. You know what I mean? Like there's a connection no, there. No, I totally get it. Yeah. Some people just, I don't think have kind of had the experience of, of like connecting the, the practicality of the, of the situation. No, that's for sure. And I think that a lot of people, I know that I've said that before just because I'm trying to be nice, you know, I'm trying to support yeah, my, yeah. my friends and then I forget, or I'm just like, shit, I don't have money right now. You know, $600 isn't going <laughs> to. Yeah. And then, like, that's, yeah. that's real as shit. Like people forget. I, I do that. It's not like, I don't want to buy yeah. the person's shirt. It's like, I forget. And then before yeah. I know it, I'm like, ah, you know, I don't, I don't know if I, don't I like the shirt that much. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I got fat now, so I can't fit it in. <laughs> not you because you work out. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, listen, like real life happens. I'm not gonna be mad at people because I do the same shit. So you yeah. know, look at look in the mirror. That's really what, what I would think to that. But it is good advice for people who are selling the merch to at least realize that people tell you, hey, I'm gonna get one. They're more than likely not gonna get one. So yeah. just, just kind of <laughs> account for that. So we were talking earlier about the thumbnails that you have for YouTube and how you know, that can attract people to come in and actually watch your content and everything. And it kind of reminds me of like a wine bottle. When you see a wine bottle with a really cool label, you're more drawn to buy that bottle of wine just because, oh, that's a cool gift to give somebody or like, oh, that's got to be good because it looks cool, quote unquote. So with thumbnails, because a lot of YouTube sites just don't have them or they have really bad ones. What do you think is the reason why they should focus on having at least decent thumbnails to get people to come watch. Yeah, I mean you you put it really well there. Like when you're when you're in an area that you don't know things well, like your first instinct is to reach out for the thing that is attractive to your eye right away. And that's going to be the mm -hmm. thumbnail. That is a, a huge mistake from new brands or, or companies or whatever putting out content on YouTube is not actually focusing on the thumbnail. And it's not even like it needs to be a, a masterpiece. Right. But like you see a lot of terrible, terrible thumbnails in the fantasy space. And I'm like, that's, you know, common denominator between any like successful piece of content needs to be like probably like a six out of 10 minimum, right? You need to like focus on that shit. And I don't, I, again, I don't really know like the formula to what makes a good thumbnail, but what I personally do again, going back to looking at other channels, like I'll, I'll just browse YouTube. It doesn't even need to be fantasy football. It could be any channel, any content creator that I admire. And I'll look at thumbnails and I'll be like, that one attracts me. And I will yep. like sit there and reverse engineer it and be like, what is it about that thumbnail that attracts me? Is it like the background color? I'll go like real niche. I'll be like, is it the outline of the person in the yeah, thumbnail? Is it the shadow? One. Yeah. Is it like the shadow behind the outline of the person? Like th those are the ways you need to be thinking. And then once you figure out 
like learn how to do it. It ain't that fucking hard. Like, go on Google, be like, how do I put a shadow behind a person? You know what I mean? Like those are the things that I think about. And those are the things that I do practically, right. In like real life situations yeah. that I think would help uh, a lot of people. Yeah. The thumbnails are not something that like we do perfectly, but I think at a bare minimum, you need to make sure that they're like decent. I agree. And there's, there's a guy's, a guy whose video channel I watch, but also listen to his podcast, Finn McKenty. He's with the punk rock NBA and he does a music channel and he did a whole thing on his business channel about thumbnails and everything. He said he changed a thumbnail and he got so many more people watching the actual video because of some little change he made, like a, even in the wording of what the title said and stuff. So yeah, that it's, is it's a shame. Yeah. It's a shame because like, some of these people, you know, you, you, you click because of the thumbnail, but you stay because of the content. A lot of the people won't even get to that part. Lot, there are so many people that probably put out fantastic content on YouTube in the fantasy yeah. space, really good information, you know, engaging like fun stuff. But if you're not putting out good thumbnails, they're never even going to get to that point. So yeah, I mean, it, it needs to be a, a major focus. And it is crazy to think that something that we focus on in 2020, you know, in 2021, but I mean, visual is the first thing you see. It's the first thing that gets you to be like, I want to, you know, yeah. if, I, if I don't like the way it looks, I'm going to think that the quality isn't going to be that great. So yeah, putting out stuff like that is super dope. Um, what do you think are some things that some YouTube channels just don't do correctly besides the thumbnail thing that they should probably wor be working on to get more viewers, more followers, more people that are actually subscribing to their content? Yeah, I think um, aside from the thumbnail, obviously the title needs to be good. I, th I think going back to other fantasy channels and seeing what works well for them and seeing how you could put your twist on it. I think so many people in fantasy football are so used to their way of putting out content that they don't realize that every platform is like wildly different from the one that they're coming from. So you see a lot of uh, people coming from the podcasting world putting podcasts on their YouTube channel and they're like putting pictures over it and they're putting these things that like don't make sense on YouTube. Like if you watch it in another YouTube video, you'd be like, this is weird. But we come from a fantasy space where like we see pictures or we're listening to podcasts all day that we're like, oh, this is not that weird. This is normal. But you have to understand that the YouTube audience is different than the Twitter audience and it's different than the podcast audience and it's different from XYZ audience, right? They're here to watch videos. Like YouTube is right. a video platform. So you have to make videos. Like what we do content wise, like we try to put all our content on all the social media platforms, but our key pillar of content is always a long form YouTube video. Like we make content, we make videos and then mm -hmm. we'll, we'll strip the audio and put it up on a podcast. We don't make a podcast first put a camera in the corner and then upload that to YouTube. So I think like, if you're going to be making videos for YouTube, mm -hmm. make videos, you know what I mean? Right. Like this is a video platform. And I think a lot of people kind of take that for granted and assume that they grew on Twitter, grew on podcasting or whatever. And like, that's just going to be the same, but it's a, it's a different audience and a different platform. And you really have to think of it from outside of the fantasy space. And do you think that YouTube, where you're able to actually like see the person who's talking and giving you the advice and, and all that jazz, do you think that that aspect of it is really appealing to like just the common fantasy football player because they're seeing you as a human and not just somebody behind a keyboard typing something up or, or yeah. saying something to a microphone? Yeah, I think it's so important. I think that like, I think that's another reason why I love YouTube because I think video is so powerful. I think you you get a better feel for a person. I think like, I don't know, I'm like, I'm weird in this way, but I, I think one of the most like underrated things in the world are like micro expressions, like mm -hmm. the expressions that people use on their face and the, just their hand gestures and shit like that. I think it makes you right. way more comfortable with people and it makes you relate to them and maybe like in a subconscious way. And I think video is so powerful in that, that you could actually feel like you get to know somebody from watching them in a five or 10 minute video. I think podcasting does have a very endearing uh, aspect to it where you can really like fall in love with someone through podcasting as well. But I think there's no replacement to, to video. And that's why I think like YouTube has such a good stronghold on it because mm -hmm. people are like falling in love with YouTube, but also like the content creators that are on YouTube. So it's like kind of right. like a two pronged approach to it. I think, yeah, I think video is just, uh, so exponentially more powerful than, than other forms of content creation. I agree. I love the whole YouTube come up in right now because I'm like, holy crap, I didn't know that person was like, you look cool. Like, what kind of bands do you like to listen to? Or, yeah, you know, like, yeah. all that stuff. Like, if I saw you 
like I know who you are, but if I was seeing you for the first time, I'd be like, okay, he's wearing a bleachers shirt. I'm pretty sure that's a bleachers shirt. Yes. Yeah. Hell okay. yeah. And he's got tattoos and he's got cool glasses and he's got a nice haircut <laughs> and all that stuff, you know, like kind of like part I, of your I brand. Cut my, I cut my own hair. Let's yeah. Go. So that's yeah. another thing. So speaking of cutting your own hair, you put out an article that was really, really like a handbook for people who want to get involved with the industry or just want to have a business mindset in general. So what was your thought process about putting that out? What's it called? Where can people find it? I know that it's pinned to the top of your uh, Twitter profile, but yeah, uh, your Twitter page, but yeah, I mean, what was that all about and why'd you do it? Uh, dude, I don't know why. <laughs> I don't really know why I did it. I just kind of like, I don't want to say blacked out, not in like a, a drunkard, like drug habity kind of way, but I just, I just sat down and I was like, I don't know. I feel like I need to write this because I feel like I've learned a lot over the last X number of years. And again, like that, that is the type of content that I like to put out when I feel like doing that shit. So I just sat down and I was like, these are, I just want to get it all off my chest. And sometimes I do that in my vlogs. Like a lot of my vlogs are just you know, they'll have like a 30 minute snippet of me talking to people as if it was a fantasy video, but it will be about some random thing that happened in my life and like how I feel about it. But that article, in a sense, I really sat down like and just wrote the entire thing in one sitting. And it was like a long ass time. And at the end, I was like, holy shit, like I just wrote basically my entire last 10 years of my life in that article. And uh, and it happened to be like right before New Year's and the new decade was coming. So I was like, oh, this is kind of like one of those corny ass like, oh, things <laughs> I wish I knew like 10 years ago before the new decade started. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it was just a combination of of things that I, I guess I've experienced in my personal life, my personal relationships, business wise. Um, and I just I just felt like it, it could probably help the the younger generation that I feel like a lot of my demographic is at this point. And the content that you have in there is evergreen, which is, I, I know that's a word a lot of people throw around, but like for real, it's going to apply to you no matter what, if it's now or, you know, three years from now, 10 years from now, whatever that everything you wrote there, it's going to hold up to the, to the test of time. So when you write something like that and you're trying to guide people and help them out, do you feel like fantasy football is getting competitive or do you feel like people are still still you know friendly helping each other trying to bring each other up instead of like you and i are you know versus each other if you will yeah I, like to be completely like frank like i don't really look at myself as as like i know i know i'm in the, <coughs> the fantasy football space yeah i don't really consider myself sure. like a fantasy football creator mm -hmm. i just like am the the creator of whatever the fuck I want to put out. A lot of it just happens to be fantasy football right now. Right. So I don't like look at anyone in the space as competition because I don't think anyone's like doing what I'm doing and not in like a, I'm better than them sense. It's just like, I'm just doing myself, me, you know, and no one else, right. no one else can do me. So it's just like, I'm not competing against anybody where, where it becomes a competition is kind of in like the numbers sense. If you're looking at it from like a subscriber, a follower, a monetization thing, then I have to ask myself, am I doing things that are too similar to people also in the industry? Then right. it can become a competitive thing. And for me, fuck yeah. Like I'm, listen, I'm running a business here and like, that's the way I look at it. I'm not competing right. against like the fantasy football industry, but if you're selling like a product that's like mine, like, yeah, we are competitors. And there are people like the footballers sell a draft kit. I sell a draft kit. Like I fucking love those dudes. They're really right. good dudes. I think I they respect really the shit out of them. I respect the shit out of their work ethic and the way they've built their brand and everything. But like at the end of the day, I'm doing what I'm doing. And like, I want to make sure that I'm successful at what I'm doing. So it can be competitive, but like, I don't, I, I don't really align with most of the people in, in the space, you know? Right. And I, I, that's why I think what you do is so refreshing because you don't touch on one in particular thing. You have a bunch of different branches. Like you were talking about the different fellows that are underneath your branch and everything or underneath your umbrella and all that stuff. And that's super dope because it does get kind of old sometimes with people when they put out the content that's just kind of recycling the same content over and over. So you guys are like a refreshing, fresh, uh, refreshing, fresh. Yes. A refreshing. Very, very refreshing. refreshing. I, I, I have it. not been drinking margaritas. I've been drinking cider. We'll get to margaritas later, uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you know, so that kind of stuff it, it, and the whole entire the group of fantasy football people on Twitter, for instance, because I'm from the Twitter 
generation. I grew, you know, not grew up because I'm 37, but I've been on Twitter for a while and I've seen the come up. It's of a lot of people because of Twitter. Do you think that Twitter has played a really crucial role in just where fantasy football is as an industry and, and not just an industry, but also as, you know, this global phenomenon, basically? Yeah, I think it's been, I think Twitter's been like almost everything for, for the fantasy industry yeah. up to this point. I think like, um, and sometimes I don't, I actually don't know, like, because we're so ingrained in it. If you're inside fantasy Twitter, you have such a, like a strong grasp on what's going on yeah. that you like, don't realize that some people don't know what's going on, you know? So you think yeah. about it and you're like, but when you're watching all these, we're in a cool industry where it's like the creators are the one that are actually like paving the way of the industry. It's not like we're not we don't have these companies with like executives that are like, we're putting out this product and this is our global marketing plan or whatever. It's just like we put out whatever content we want and we're going to be the way we're, we're going to be the ones that pave the way for the industry for the next 10 years. And I also think about that. Like, I'm just like, this is cool. Cause I can inspire a bunch of creators within the fantasy space over the next 10 years to not only want to do fantasy. Like you could right. also be like a, a pillar of the fantasy industry, but not have to be someone who only does fantasy stuff. So Twitter is definitely been instrumental if not like the biggest part of the industry in my opinion but i also think it will be the downfall of a lot of people over the next five years because they've gotten so accustomed to that being the place that they grew on that they'll be and we, we're seeing it now we're seeing it yeah. with youtube we're seeing it with tiktok we're seeing it with all the platforms instagram all the dudes who got big on twitter don't want to pivot yeah. and they're going to realize really quickly that that's a huge mistake I, yeah, I mean, you have to. I mean, there wasn't a such such a thing as MySpace, you know, fantasy football MySpace. But if there was, I mean, hopefully those guys wouldn't still be over there trying. Yeah, to yeah. I mean, that's that's what it was. If there was, like, the people would still be on it, and like that would have been their claim to fame. And you were talking about Instagram too, and I know that you did your own um, little. I guess you had a series, right? Because I watched a couple episodes <laughs> to learn how to talk to people, you know. Yeah. And you had a series where you were talking to. Uh, people in the fantasy football industry. And it was not a, a little thing. It was huge because you had some of the biggest, baddest names, you know, out there on your podcast talking business, which is something you don't usually hear those people talking about. And you had the fantasy football counselor on, and I know that, that he rubs some people the wrong way, but yeah. what is the importance of having people talk to you and getting a different side of people? of, you know, one guy thinks one thing, another guy has a completely different business plan, but it's working for person A and person B. What's the importance of showing there's different routes to go? Yeah, I mean, that that was that was really the reason I started it was to show these younger people that mm -hmm. like, you don't need to, you don't need to do what I'm doing to get where I'm at. Like, you right. don't need to do what this blogger did to get where he's at, right? It's It was just trying to, when I first started, I was like, I'm gonna just get the most diverse group of people. Like the first season I did it, it was, you know, Andy Holloway was the first one I got on. Obviously mm -hmm. big time company guy, like created this big ass brand. And then I brought on a guy who was, you know, the counselor, huge on Instagram. And then I brought on a, a, a woman, Paige, and I brought on Brad who was big on Yahoo. And I'm like, I want all different points of view so that when you look at like who you are as a person, you can't be like, nah, like I can't make it because all these people have wildly different backgrounds. And it's like, of course you can't make it. You just have to do what's like natural to you. So when I started, yeah, that was it. But you know, I do that every off season. So like yeah. when I'm not doing in-season content, I start yeah. this up probably like January, February through NFL draft time. And mm -hmm. that's like an outlet for me because as you can see, like I'm super passionate about the, yeah. the business side of things. So like this is a way for me to talk to people that I think are innovating within the space. And over like the three year time span that I've been doing it, I've obviously grown as a, as a person and, and gotten more experience in the, in, on the business side of things. Yeah. So like my mind, my, my viewpoint on the on the series itself has kind of taken a a pivot towards like what I'm trying to get out of it. And I've been talking to people that I think are a little bit more experienced in the sense and maybe not talking to the beginner so much, which is yeah. maybe a bad pivot when it comes to like thinking about my audience, but maybe it's a little bit of a, a selfish interview series at this point. And and to yeah. be and to be completely frank with you, like I'm at the point where I've interviewed a lot of the people. There's not many like businesses and brands within fantasy, right? right. Like no, you have not. a lot of people kind of doing the same thing, like kind of doing podcasting or blogging or whatever, but sure. I don't see like a ton of innovation from a business standpoint, like a monetization kind of standpoint. Right. So I'm, I'm kind of like trying to figure out like who I want to bring on for the next season. 
Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of been a, a little bit of a struggle for me. And I'm thinking like from a personal standpoint, like maybe I just start to interview other creators outside of the space that like kind of have inspired me, whether they're in fantasy sports or whether they're fucking, I don't know, making camera parts or creating clocks or whatever. I don't know. You know whatever the case may be. Um, yeah, I don't know. The, the, the series has kind of just been an ongoing uh, twist and, and branch of wherever my life is, has gone in a sense. Well, yeah. And I mean, like Dax Shepard, he has his podcast and dude, you know, dude, Dak Shepard's podcast. I tweeted. I t So I tweeted. Sorry to cut you off. Like I tweeted out like last week or two weeks ago. I was like, does anyone have any podcast suggestions uh, outside of like fantasy, outside of sports, outside of, you know, that kind of shit. Yeah. And uh, JJ Zacharyson commented the Dak Shepard podcast <clears throat> and I been listening to it like nonstop. Yeah, you've that been dude is so fucking smart. Oh my God, he is. It's unbelievable. I didn't. I had no idea like who he was, and he is uh, like yeah. just he's so good at what he does too. We're talking he's almost like a, a more intellectual version. It's like a more intellectual version of like the Joe Rogan podcast. Yeah, which is not a knock on Joe Rogan. He's no, wildly I mean, he intellectual as well. But like, he, he yeah, I don't know. They're, they're they're kind of the same. They just interview like awesome people. But he has the amount of knowledge up in his brain is fucking mind blowing. No, I, I love listening to his podcast. That's another one. Like when I decided I want to do an interview podcast, I was like, oh, but like I listened to Dax and I'm like, there's no way in hell I'm going to be able to talk to people because like he makes it sound so eloquent, eloquent. See, I can't even talk. And, and I'm like, I'm just this person who's over here just trying to learn, you know, yeah. another selfish kind of thing, but I'm trying to learn. So learning from you guys, when you talk to me, I know other people are learning too, but it really helps me out. But with Dax, like he brings in, you know, people at the top of their field to come in and do, you know, the experts on experts and stuff. So like, that's something I don't think people would shy away from on your channel. If you were to do something like that, I think that, yeah, be, you know, yeah. like that, that's what I've thought about. Like long-term I was like, yeah, it would be so cool to start bringing on all these like top world class yeah. kind of people and shit. I know I'm like 10 years away from ever having those people on, but I, I wonder that too, if like I can even hold up that conversation. Cause I think dudes like Joe Rogan and Dak Shepard have gone through so much in their life. They're so yeah. experienced that like, them being able to keep up that conversation comes from the fact that they've actually lived through some of the shit that they're talking about, you know, like you can invite someone that you think is interesting on, but if yeah. you can't relate to them on a personal level, it does make the interview, it you know, does. kind of tough. So it, it's a combination of like these dudes, you know, like Joe Rogan, people are like, oh, it's just like Joe Rogan kind of like sits there and like smokes weed and just talks to people. It's like, dude, you underestimate the amount of work he probably puts in and the, yeah. and the amount of research that he does for each fucking person to come on and be able to relate to them on like every topic. That that's a hundred percent. It's a hundred percent going into it blindly and not knowing anything about the person that you're talking to is just I, I, you terrible learn, idea. You Have you, did, you go into, did you go into any of your interviews on this on this series without like actually like doing any research? Just so, like oh, I'm so cool, I'll be able to do a conversation. I'm gonna be honest because that's part of this podcast. Last night I interviewed a guy that I know. He's an up and coming guy in the fantasy football industry, but he doesn't have a whole lot of background besides the last year or two. So it was harder to come up with things to ask him just because he didn't have, you know, that background. So I found myself kind of stumbling over my questions more than I'd like, even though I had things written down. It just, yeah. I didn't feel like I was going to get a huge answer from it. So yeah, it's, it's important now. That's what I've realized too. Like when I first started, I was like, oh, who am I going to get on for the series? Now I'm like really selective. Like who am yeah. I going to get good shit out of? Who am I like passionate about listening to? Who do I want to sure. actually learn from, you know? And those will get it out because you're like asking genuine questions, not questions that you like feel like you need to ask, you know? For sure. Yeah, exactly. And you want to learn from the person that you're talking to. You want to interview somebody that you find something about them is appealing. You want to find out why they've made it the way that they have. Like I've had Ed, Eddie Barron's on here. Like I said, I, I listed off the guys that like, I was like, whoa, 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 at first, really nervous. Even with you today, I was like, oh my God, because <laughs> your business mind is just so freaking out there that I can't even like hold a candle to that. And so but then when I start talking, it's like, wow, this comes out a lot easier than it does with somebody that I like actually know, you know? Yeah. I just, stuff. yeah, I, I don't, I, I, I think like when I talk about this stuff, maybe it's yeah. a little far fetched, but I try to like, I guess, relate it to like everyday normal life. Like I'm not right. like any, I'm not like better than anybody. I'm not smarter right. than anybody. I just like, I've experienced, you know, if, if you've never sold merch, like you, you wouldn't understand what I was saying before that. But if I'm right. like, 
yo, listen, it's really not that easy. It's really not that profitable. It's like everybody can relate to that. Like, oh, it's not that. It's actually not that glamorous. When people post their new T-shirts on Twitter, it's like, OK, like you're going to sell four of them and then not really give a shit about them anymore. You know, it's just I don't know. I guess uh, it, it's just the fact that I've, I've been doing it. I'm really passionate about it. I've been doing it yeah, for, for sure. five to seven years. So, of course, I have a little bit more experience, but it's not, you know, it's not on a level that we can't relate to as a as a human. Exactly. And a lot of people that have come on here have talked about imposter syndrome and feeling like, you know, they shouldn't be where they are and all this stuff. And it's like, you really need to take a look in the mirror. Did you ever have a, an experience like that where you felt like you shouldn't be where you are and that there's people out there that like you can't even like, I know that you're a big Brad Evans fan. Like, were you ever like, I just shouldn't be like brought up in the same sentence as Brad Evans? Uh, Yeah. Like, I think about that all the time. I think <laughs> I think I, I think about like imposter syndrome. Um probably daily, maybe yeah. weekly. I don't know. It, it's like, as you progress as a person, as you set new goals for yourself, like you, you want more, like you're going to go right. after something more ambitious. And every time you're going after something that's you've never done before, you're going to be like, I can't do this. Like, that's not me, you know? So you interview person X and you were really nervous about it. You're like, I'm an imposter. Then you do yeah. it. And then you get to the next person. That's maybe a little bit higher than them. And you're like, I shouldn't be here. And before you know it, you look back and you're like, I'm also the person that just did that. Like, you know what I mean? Like there's no, di yeah. there's, there's not like a special click inside of you or switch inside of you that like you're better than another person. It's just like right. the people who do things did them and the people who haven't like haven't. So yeah, I feel it all the time, but I just try to tell myself that like, there's nobody that's, I mean, of course there are very, very special people like on the planet, but 99.9% .9 of the shit that's gotten done yeah. on earth is just people working hard and just people uh, maybe right place, right time, people that are willing to put themselves out there. So yeah, I mean, I feel imposter syndrome all the time, but like, I think it's important that people know that that's normal for everybody. Right. It's normal for everybody. I know going into it when I first started and, and I'm not anything now. I mean, I, I'm a lot bigger than I was when I first started out, but it's like, well, why do you, why do people want to listen to me? Why do people want to see what I'm doing? So how important do you think practicing, like talking to people, practicing, having, you know, conversations, even if you're, a po you're doing a podcast, maybe the first couple of episodes aren't going to be that great because you're just learning. How important is getting those reps in? Yeah. I mean, it, I, I think it's kind of like a subjective thing. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I guess I, I was lucky in a sense that I was always like really comfortable on camera. So it didn't take me a lot of reps to like get sure. comfortable, but anytime I've done shows with new people, uh, and I know that they're like not comfortable, it definitely takes some time to ease into that. And I think that's like, it, it's the, it's, it's kind of your job as, as, um, I guess from my point of view, like I, I kind of have to be a leader for the people that I take on to do content with me, right? If they're going to be like on my team in a sense, I have to like understand that from like a personality standpoint and like what makes you comfortable, what makes you not comfortable and kind of segue that way. So it's like, yeah, yeah, reps, reps absolutely matter. I mean, for, for most things, if you, you, I think showing up unprepared is, is like, is the single most important thing that you should not do. Like being unprepared for things you could tell in a second. Um, so I think like having reps is important, but I also like, you're going to fuck up in the beginning. Yeah. Like, that's completely normal. Um, I, I think a lot of it just goes back to like knowing imposter syndrome, fucking up. All these things are normal. All these things are okay. Like it's going to happen. You have no, you have no chance of fading those things. For sure. And, and with, when it comes to like being comfortable in front of the camera and everything, I can firsthand say like this scared the fuck out of me before I actually started doing it. Like there, before I even guess it on a podcast, I was like, what do I need? What kind of equipment do I need? Do I need to have this? Do I need to have that? Where do I need to be to do it? And really at the end of the day, yeah, I've improved some of the stuff that I have, but at the end of the day, you want to put out content and people want you on their show, then jump on and kind of just learn, you know? It's the only um, way, yeah. It's the only yeah. way you're going to learn is by, is by doing shit. And, and once you screw something up, your, your body and your mind pays extra special attention to it. When you get into like a rhythm of doing yeah. things that are comfortable, you don't really grow from that. You need to do things that like really, you know, not to be cliche, but like once you're out of your comfort zone, that's when your body like really, uh, there's an alert, there's a trigger that's like, ah, fuck, like you need to figure out how to do this or you're going to look like a fool. So that's when you change. Like you, you got to fuck up in the beginning. For Yeah. And I know that mental health is a big thing. And like being, you know, having anxiety is a big thing. A lot of people struggle with that. I know I do. And I've been very candid about like, I take meds for it and keeps, keeps me, you know, at least like, I don't feel too bad. Like my heart's going to explode before I come on here, but you still get the anxiety. So people just need to realize that that's part of it. But if you're not, like you said, I really like the quote that you were talking about, like, you're going to grow 
but you have to do things that cause you to have anxiety in order to do it. You yeah. Know? Like your brain, your brain's not going to recognize it. Your no. brain's not going to be like, ah, we need to figure this problem, how to solve this problem out, right. you know, cause you're just, it's such an uncomfortable position for most, most people. And when I was talking to TJ Hernandez, he said, well, on his show, when he was interviewing people, the first time he had people on were people that he knew. So he had at least had conversations with them and stuff before. And I'm kind of like all over the place. Like I've never talked to you before. And I've like swung for the fences and have like slid into people's DMs like a crazy person, like, please come on my show. So, you know, big name guys. Like oh, dude, I've, I've been left on red on, on that business series. Like there, yeah. there are probably a dozen people I could think of all the top of my head that just yeah. never answered my Twitter DM. And I'm just like, I do take it personally. For, yeah. You know, I'm just like, ah, you motherfucker, <laughs> like, why don't you want to come on? But like, again, it goes back yeah. to like the selling of clothing or whatever. It's like yeah. their time, their energy. It's like, yeah. It might have just been wrong place, wrong time that they exactly. saw that it is it is what it is. You know, I like you can't really take that shit to heart. It's uh you gotta have thick skin. No, you can't. Stuff. And and just like the selling with clothing of when people say, Oh yeah, I'll buy, you know, I'll buy a, sh a shirt just the same. I feel yeah. with people that are like, Yeah, I'll come on your show sometime and then they just leave it at that, or like, I'm really busy right now, but sometime I'll come on. And then you like win, and then they don't say anything. It's the same thing, you know. Yeah, so yeah. I mean, every, yeah, busy, it's like, you know, so people are busy. People have time, and they want to spend their time doing the thing that's going to be the most productive for them. So yeah, it happens. Come on, a little podcast like mine. But then there's cool people like you who are like, yeah, sure, you know, because dude, I love these fucking conversations <laughs> oh like you so dude, much, dude. So. I've already said it. I'm not, I'm not an interviewer. That's not what I want to do. What I want to do is just like make this a fucking like sit down. We're having a conversation with even like people from like the big name sites that are like ESP and Yahoo and everything else. And they come on and they're like a totally different person than they are when they're on TV. Because like you were saying earlier, some people have to like, you know, you have to watch what you say when you work for certain sites and you can do what you want because you're your boss, you know? So how important do you think it is to like, if you aren't in one of those big, big, big sites, how important do you think it is to just, I know we've touched on it a lot, but just to, to put yourself out there like that and, and, you know, curse if you want to curse and, and wear what you want to wear and do what you want to do. Dude, I, th I think like, I think over the next, whatever, like three to five years, yeah. if you are not your, your 100% complete self on, on these platforms, mm -hmm. That's the common denominator right now. Like if you're not doing that as the minimum, I know there's so many people that, and I hate like using the word authenticity now because it's like, it's become like a buzzword and it's kind of like cringy in a sense. But yeah. if you're really not hundred percent yourself on these videos, like you, you'll talk to me now and then you yeah. can go watch a video of me on my channel. You're going to get the same person. You walk into my fucking apartment right now, have a conversation yeah. with me. Like you won't get any different emotions, any different reactions out of me than, than exactly how I am now. And I think that is so like attractive and refreshing to people mm -hmm. that subscribe to your channel for fantasy football or for whatever the fuck you're talking about. I think over the next three to five years, like if you're not doing that at the bare minimum, there's no fucking way you're going to succeed. You know, like whatever you're doing, I think authenticity and like being really, really you and being able to be vulnerable and open about like who you are as a person is, is like one of the only thing that's going to keep your audience growing and, and them being loyal to you. For sure. Because they feel like they're, you know, they feel like they're your friends. They feel like they are, you know, very close to you, even though you guys may have never met or only had a passing conversation. Like being able to see people like you, the footballers, you know, the people that interact on a daily basis, all these new podcasts that are coming up with all these co-hosts that like feed off of each other so well. It's just great to see. And I know that some of the guys that are in a part of your team were guys that you have known forever growing up with these guys and things like that. How important do you think that kind of chemistry is to building a brand and not having like everything just kind of fail? Uh, interesting, interesting question. Cause like though, so we have a few, I would, I would say maybe we have like eight, seven, six, six to eight people probably like on the team, I would say, uh, -huh. uh one of the one, uh, two of the people I do a show with that we do on this table right behind me, right. they come from the same town that I grew up in. So I've known them for a long time, but they were not like I, one of them was a close friend of mine, but not like my best friend at any point. Another yeah. one I didn't really even know until we kind of started doing playing fantasy football and stuff together. Uh -huh. So I, th I think there's there's probably a fine line. I, I think like the better chemistry you have, like if I was doing content with like literally my best friends and stuff and yeah. they knew fantasy football, I think our content would be incredible like through through the fucking roof like no stopping it but i also think there's there's a fine line between people that maybe 
make you think differently too. Like mm -hmm. I look at things with my best friend, like we're the same fucking person, you know, like I'm thinking something, he's thinking the same thing. Yeah. And when someone else kind of comes into the game and you know them and the chemistry is good and you could, I think like you, one, you need to be on like the same sense of humor level, right? Like that's what makes good chemistry there. Yeah. But if they think differently than you, then it's going to make for good content as well. It's going to make for like argumentative pieces. It's going to make for like more growth and, and thought pieces like that. So I think there definitely needs to be chemistry, obviously. Um, but like how that chemistry comes about, I think can probably come in, in a bunch of different ways. There's a lot of content out there that's made by two people that are so fucking different from each other that that just works, you know? For sure. I also agree with that. Like I, I watch these shows and I listen to these shows and stuff and, and you can tell who has it, you know, who would be better off probably being a, a solo podcast versus being with a co-host and stuff. What do you think that the biggest difference between having a co-host and doing it on your own is? Hmm. Uh, I, I think that's kind of a subjective thing again, too. I don't think a lot, a lot of people like to do solo shows, but for me, I've always kind of been like an independent person. I think I, um, I think I work better by myself. I think I'm more clear when I'm by myself because I don't have like interruptions, but when I'm doing stuff with my friends, when it's not so like information based and we're just kind of like shooting the shit, I think it can be funny that way. So I think, I think it kind of talks to your personality. Uh, however you kind of, you know, give off your value prop, the best probably works for you. But I, I've gotten comfortable to where I, I think I'm versatile enough that I, I could do it with, you know, myself, I could do it with two people or three people or, or whatever it is. But that, that is something that takes practice. Like I was um, doing interviews, like when I did it on my channel it was something that I need to, like, I still need to get better at it. Like even talking with you, like I'll cut you off sometimes. And I know you're like, Oh, don't worry about it. It's fine. But I'm like, fuck. Yeah. I'm like, fuck, like, I keep doing it over and over. And like, sometimes yeah. I'll, I'll do that with people that I bring on my channel and like, they're not done talking. And I'm like, gonna jump in because i was like oh i have a point and yeah, like, yeah and yeah and like some people are cool with it some people are like oh no it makes a conversation like beautiful and natural yeah, yeah. like and, and you know and and i like having conversations with people like that but some yeah. people like you kind of take their mojo and then they lose their train of thought uh, and it comes like, back to like you know you have to figure out what kind of person they are like can yeah. you do that all the time or like you know i i think there's like a lot of nuance to this shit I have to like write words down, like keywords down on a notebook, just so I can remember to go back to it. And I still forget it. Half the time. I do that shit in the interview too, all the time. I, I give them usually like, I'll, I'll send them over a show sheet of probably yeah. like six, six key points I want to touch on. And then yeah. throughout it, I'll have a notepad and I'll just be like writing down like a, I don't know the word it'll be like wall whatever they said it'll be something stupid and I'll be like make sure I get back to that. And then half the time I forget to bring it up again. I the exact same way. And I, I haven't been doing this this long, but uh, <laughs> that's how it's been going for me. I have a list. And today I was like, okay, I'm going to put it in order of the way that I want to ask, you know, hit on things, but I'm still, you know, you guys start talking and you get to the questions that I already have that I want to touch on. So it's dope. And I, I don't send a show sheet out just because like, I feel like you should already freaking know, <laughs> you know, yeah. ask, it's a business, you know, shit. If it was like a fantasy football related podcast or whatever. And, and that's another thing when it comes to podcasting and stuff is like, you don't know that there's going to, the work that you have to put into like coming up with the show and putting, oh, yeah. putting, you know, this, that, and the other and getting all the stats. Cause you don't want to talk all stats. You want to be able to appeal to the normal fantasy football player and the degenerate that's like in 20 leagues or whatever. So how do you figure out? or find a way to balance that out where you don't come off as a complete stat nerd, but at the same time, you know, you are giving the important information, the main course to people. Yeah. I think, um, I don't know if I really have a strategy for it per se. I, I kind of just do whatever's comfortable for me. And I've like, I, I guess I'm, I'm fortunately like good at communicating to the people in my demographic. Like I, I'm just, I think it goes back to like the personality again. Like if you're okay showing your personality and like talking how you would talk to your best friend or your mom or whoever it is, and you talk to your audience that way, they they can understand you on like an emotional level. And I think when you do that, like you come across with the numbers and stats uh, a lot more clearly to them because they're they're not like worrying about like, oh, like what is this guy saying? What is he doing? Is he telling me the fucking truth? Is he telling me important things? Once you kind of have that loyalty behind it, you stop worrying about all like the outside nonsense and you can kind of listen to them uh, speaking about what they're speaking about. So like I like to go really fucking in depth with my stats, but like I also drop F-bombs all the time in my videos. I also like stop mid video and start talking about like a fucking date I went on this weekend or something. You know what I mean? Like yeah, sure. there's, there's no direction that I really, I, like I have notes and stuff that I want 
to go down, but yeah. like I will never stop myself and be like, I can't do that because I, I need know. to get to like this fucking yeah. separation stat or yards per carry stat or whatever. So I think it's again, it goes back to like really being natural to who you are. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I can't agree with that even anymore because you, you hit it right on the head. Um, what's just harder, do you think, to give out? Do you think fantasy football advice is harder to give out or business advice is harder to give out? Uh, I Harder in the sense that I, I would say – Fantasy football advice is is easy to give out, I would say. There's yeah. an abundance of it in the industry. There's people that do it way better than me and you, and there are people that do it better than those people that do it better than us. You can find fantasy information anywhere. It's tough to give it out because so many people are relying on you when you do give it out. If you're like, yo, I love this dude, make sure you draft him in the first round. Half of your audience is going to own, like, I loved fucking Miles Sanders this year. And now I know I'm never going to hear the end of it throughout the next summer. Like, dude, you told us all to draft Miles Sanders, whatever, you know, first round, second round. So it's like, it's not, it's not difficult to come up with like information to give out for fantasy football podcasts. It's fucking everywhere. And people regurgitate the same stats business wise. Like, I don't, I don't give out business advice. I just like tell you what's happened to me. You know, right. like I'm just like, this happened to my business. Mm -hmm. uh, here's what I would have done differently. And here's like X, Y, Z, Y. So it's not like a right or wrong. It's just like, this is what happened to me, you know? And you could kind of yeah. take it however you want. So I try to be as transparent with that shit as possible. So it's kind of like fantasy football is more like black and white where like people will get mad at you based on what you say. The, <laughs> business, the business and personal shit is just like, you can't be mad at me for, like, I telling, like <laughs> for, yeah, like for telling you what happened in my life. Like that's yeah. not, you know, I'm not telling you to do anything. Right. I'm just telling you my experience. And just like we were talking about everybody that's come up in the fantasy football industry has different life experiences. And so, yeah, I mean, you could look at 12 different people's rankings and you can look at 12 people's different, you know, life stories and the, the rankings are going to be closer than the life stories. So yeah. yeah, for sure. How important do you think it is to interact with, people that interact with you, your fans, your, your group or whatever, how important is it to, to talk to them and give them, you know, what they want to hear? Do like everything. I think like another, another huge mistake I think people make in fantasy because they're on Twitter is that they care more about like the fantasy football community than their own community. Yes. I'm like, oh my gosh. I didn't even think about that until now. Sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, but. no, you're, you're fine. Like I, when I thought of that too, I was like, yo, this is like, it's so backwards. Yeah. People that are trying to come up in the industry through the industry are doing it wrong. Like you have to create your own thing, your own space, your own community, and that will force other people to recognize you. Like, again, I don't look at myself as like a fantasy creator. You will very, very rarely, if ever, find me on Twitter interacting with people in the industry about fantasy football conversations. I talk to people that like reply to my tweets on a personal level. I'll talk to my people like on YouTube comments. We're on discord. We have like a text platform. Like I talk to my people because those are the people that I attract. And those are the people that I like get along with in life. And again, nothing, nothing against the people in the fantasy industry. Right. I don't really relate to them on a personal level. They're all like really good dudes and very hardworking. Yeah, for sure. We're just like different. And I just, I just, I just, I don't know. That's just not really my thing. And I think like people trying to force themselves into that are yep. looking at things very backwards. I get that. I feel like when I'm on Twitter and I'm talking to people, I feel like I start following more people who are like, Hey, what kind of band do you like? And we start talking about music, not talking about fantasy football, but talking about that or some television show that I liked or a movie or something, you know, something that appeals to me. That's not fantasy football related. I think that Having that, like that shit feels good, right? Like that shit feels, those are fun conversations to have. It's nice for somebody to say, I heard you on this podcast say, or I read that you wrote this, but it's also cool to say, Hey, I saw you in a rancid shirt and I really like rancid. Like, what's your favorite song? This kind of stuff. Like, then yeah. you're like hey, you uh, know me as a person. Yeah. I also, it's probably a combination. Like, I, I'm, I'm kind of like, uh, I guess a little bit more cynical about like <laughs> fantasy football and the industry itself than, than the normal person doing it. Um, because when I started this whole shit, like I was very passionate about fantasy yeah. and not that I don't like it anymore. Like I will always play fantasy and I'll have fun doing it. Yeah, but, sure. but like I've, I've definitely lost a little bit of steam with how passionate I am about it, but it's not from like a dull standpoint. It's because I've picked up passion in other parts of it, Mo mainly conversations like these, like marketing and, and figuring out how to scale what we're doing here with other people being a little bit more passionate about fantasy football. So it, it's probably on a personal level that I, less enjoy talking about that kind of stuff within my community and within the community itself. 
Um, so it's not like right or wrong. I don't want to like come out off here like super pretentious and being like, you shouldn't be doing this shit. But like <laughs> on a personal level, it's just about knowing who you are. You know what I mean? Like there's no right or wrong. There's just you're right. And, and everything right. else that's not you is wrong. Some people, their life is stats and that's why they got into it. Or their life is watching film or their life is this or their life is that. And that's the hobbies they like to do. And that's what sure. they like to talk about. And, you know, I don't want to talk about fantasy all the time. How do you feel about the people that are like stick to football, you know? Oh, like those people, I, I, I low key love those kind of comments because I get to like fucking fire back at them. I love, I love fighting with people on Twitter, like about random shit for no, (laughs) just like, I I like using my energy on that shit just for no fucking reason. Uh, those people are just like, I don't know. I mean, at this point in my life, I'm like very comfortable with where I'm at and like who I am in my, in, in my own skin and shit. So people that are cynical like that, or people have such narrow viewpoints on life. I'm like, dude, I feel really bad for you that you don't get to enjoy like normal life. It's not like a me versus you thing. It's like a dude that sucks that you don't get to like have viewpoints on, on life in, in in a positive or an opening way. Like you'll never change your viewpoint. Like what you just respond. How can you read what I just said? Like I always know if my intention's good, I don't worry about the things I say. That that's really what it comes down to. And if you can't right. understand that like my intention was coming from like a good place or at least like a funny place or whatever the fuck it may be, mm. then that that's not on me. That's not on me to control. Like I can't control how you react to what I say. Mm-hmm. And some people just take things to heart and they don't realize that there are people out there that are just dicks. Like, you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, there's dicks. So what kind of advice do you have for people who, you know, want to get involved in the fantasy football industry, want to do that kind of stuff, but they don't have thick enough skin to like handle having criticism, you know, is that something that they might not be able to get over? Or do you think that there's a way to overcome that? I mean, yeah, like, I don't, I don't know if there's a way to like overcome that. I think you kind of have to change your mindset again, like going back to the people who leave comments on my YouTube videos about, about something like almost 99.9% of the time, it's just a reflection of their own insecurity. Like if they're making fun of you for like a physical appearance thing, or if they're making fun of you for like X, Y, Z, it's because they have insecurities about themselves and they want to shift the attention to you rather than it. It's, it's always like a, a, like a subconscious thing from them. I'm just like, dude, like I feel you have to feel bad for those people because you know they're in like a really bad for you to go onto a YouTube video, like watch it. Like when I post this, I'll probably get negative comments. I'll be like, dude, how, like, how are you going to watch this conversation? Like, understand that we're just like having fun and like the intent here is good. And then being like, blah, 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 like, fuck you. I'm like, dude, you know, like, I, I don't know. It, it, I don't know if it's about developing thick skin as, as it is uh, developing maybe a thicker mind, you know? Hey, thicker, yeah, like thicker mindset. Hey, that's a <laughs> t-shirt put, slogan. Put that on it. Yeah, put that on a fucking t-shirt. <laughs> so you're like super motivational, even if you don't mean to come off that way. The things that you say and the way that you express them come off like, oh my gosh, I look up to this dude, what he's doing, especially since you have so many younger followers. It's pretty cool to have them look up to you and stuff. Have you ever thought about doing something like having some sort of either, you know, motivational kind of thing? Or like a like a YouTube series or anything like that where you like have people come in and or whatever I don't know because I'm not cool like that I can come up with cool ideas but you know whatever. Um, yeah, uh, it's kind of funny. Thank you. That that is like an actual compliment. Um, and and I I kind of take it like oddly in a sense as you could tell i'm kind of like stumbling over my words i don't really know how to fucking take it uh i don't try to like again i don't really try to be motivational but i think in today's world like being transparent is motivation you know like that in a sense is so i don't like i i don't want to like try to preach about shit but like i've been through some shit that i think would help people out but i I don't think i ever approach things from a motivational standpoint like ever going back to uh like the business conversation thing it's just like I'm just telling you what I've been through and like what I hope you can learn from it. Um, so the intent is is not really to be like motivational because I think most people have this idea of what motivation is. It's like, oh, some like rah-rah shit, like get excited. And I'm like, that's that's not what I think motivates most people. I think what yeah. motivates most people is actually seeing real shit done. I think that's why I like documented from the age where I was like 22 or 23, because that's real motivation. Like that shit, you, when you're a 22 year old kid and you see a 22 year old guy who has eventually become successful eight years down the line, you're like, ah, shit, like that's actually motivational to me. Cause it means that I can, I can do that. Right. It's like real putting the real energy and the real practicality and, and, and like real life in it, you know? So, For sure. um, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think I'd ever approach things from a motivational standpoint, but I'm, but I'm, but I'm glad that like people can take motivation from it. 
For sure. Uh, yeah. And who knows where you're going to be in 10 years. Maybe you will be, you know, we'll listen back. Yeah. To- yeah. I also think you, do you ever listen to like Gary V? You know, what Gary V is. I do know Gary V. I haven't, people have suggested him to me and I've listened to a couple of podcasts, but I'm just like one of those people that listens to like one or two and then like jumps to another one. So I don't, yeah, think I-, I fucking love that dude. Like more yeah. than anyone I think on the planet. And I don't, I'm, that's not even, that's not even hyperbole. Like I, that guy has changed my life and my mindset in ways that I can't even explain. Right. But he, I, I think a lot of the ideas that I have in my head kind of stem from a lot of the shit that he says. And I think about it, I'm like, oh shit, like that made so much sense. And then I start thinking about it and kind of like branch my ideas off of that. And he, and he gets, he says that shit all the time too. He's just like, dude, I'm not a motivational speaker. You know, I'm just like telling you what's what I'm telling you, like what's actually happening and what I've been through and, and, and that kind of stuff. So I, uh, I, I needed to shout out Gary V because I never come on one of these kind of podcasts and, and don't talk about him. No, I, it's really awesome. And people can go and listen to that and see exactly what you're talking about. So it's really cool to find a new, a new thing that really motivates you and gets you going. So it's good to have those people that you can listen to. Is there any other like podcasts that you listen to maybe outside of the fantasy football realm that you think do a really good job of, of putting out what you would put out if you were doing what they were doing? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. I I listen to a lot of podcasts. It's definitely my main form of consumption when it comes to content. I don't watch a lot of videos. Uh, ironically, I don't. I almost <laughs> never read blog posts. Uh, my podcast lineup is almost like one hundred percent fantasy stuff, and well, fifty percent fantasy stuff, fifty percent like marketing and um, business stuff. So I listen to a lot of niche podcasts that interview people who run businesses Mm -hmm. um and like i'm I'm so weird like sometimes i'll like go downstairs and i'll sit i'll sit on my couch and i'll sit in front of my tv but i like won't turn my tv on i'll turn my speaker on and i'll put like a podcast on like that it's so like that's legitimately just what i enjoy doing and i'm glad that like in today's world that's a really good thing to be interested in because it could make you be super productive so i could pull up my podcast right now and and talk about some of the or just like mention some of the the better yeah. Uh, marketing podcast that I listen to. Just give me I'm one second. New podcast to listen to because I love hearing people interact with other people and just kind of get bouncing ideas off of each other. It's just ugh, podcast. Yeah. Are- so there's one called Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Um, so actually, I guess some of them are business, but uh, some of them are like lifestyle focused and okay. uh, like nutrition, health, like fucking weird shit, like anti aging kind of stuff. So um, <laughs> Dave Asprey, Bulletproof Radio. We have just straight up social media marketing with Michael Stelzner. Uh, the Gary V audio experience, um, SPI with Pat Flynn. Um, and then I am kind of obsessed with like some of Barstool's podcasts that are not like comedy focused, but the, the founder of it, uh, Dave Portnoy does a podcast about like the inner workings of Barstool. It's called the Dave Portnoy show. Um, and I think he's like one of the most brilliant minded marketers in the world right now. Uh, so I kind of like consume anything he puts out that has any relevance to, to business. So most of almost all the content I consume is, is like for work. If it's not like giving me information that I could use to put out other content, then, um, then I probably don't, I, I, it's weird, but I don't listen to a lot of shit for like that. Most people would consider enjoyment. It's enjoyment to me, but like most people would be like, why the fuck are you listening to that? You know? Well, talk, talking about listening to podcasts and listening to things that are focused on work and things of that nature are you one of those people people that can't turn it off like even when you're out you you're still kind of thinking in the back of your mind like oh you know tomorrow or whatever like work yeah work <laughs> uh yeah yeah so like yeah always like my 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 work is my is my life it's it's yeah. my lifestyle at this i think i would say and uh and and that's in a very like fortunate tone like i've been able to kind of intertwine what i do for work with 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 my life. Like I will have a camera most places that I go yeah. and I've tried to kind of make sure that like my friends are also now part of my content so that it's never like work life balance. It's almost just like everything I do is kind of work related because even the stuff that I'm not filming or creating content off of like feeds the energy that I kind of need for my work in a sense. So uh, my brain doesn't shut off when it comes to thinking about work stuff, but in a, in a positive way. Excellent. A lot of people talk about work and it's always in a negative way when you're out and stuff with your friends. You're like, just stop talking about it. So, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, dude, like a lot of my friends, yeah, like especially people that I meet that are like new, I kind of like tell them what I do and they'll be like, oh, I'm sorry. Like, do you mind if I ask you questions about it? You know, like I know like people hate it talking about work and I'm like, low key, I'm like super fucking happy to talk about any any questions that you have, you know? 
And I, and I love that even though like I have a full-time job, that's not this, obviously this is just uh, me right now, just trying to like grind and have fun. Um, but when people do find out that I like, write for the fantasy footballers or whatever, they'll be like, Oh man, that's so cool. Can I ask you? Like, I even had a teacher. I used to work at a school, and a teacher that was like, "Hey, I want you to come in and like talk to my third graders about you know writing for a fantasy football website." So like, the stuff that can come out of it is so dope. So yeah, dude, that's like that. It's you know, people put things on a pedestal. I feel like and don't understand uh, almost like the ramifications of of what they're doing. Like mm-hmm. like you you saying that and and getting that opportunity because you did that is 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 like, it's, it's real life. It's super practical, you know? Yeah. And, and like this interview series yeah. will put you on the map for things when they think about lifestyle things or business content. And a lot of the, the reason I do like the behind the business series is mm-hmm. because I'm passionate about this. And this like segues my content into a business realm. So like eventually when those videos or, or podcasts start doing bigger numbers, there will be people outside of the fantasy industry, like taking notice and being like, Oh, you know, this, this kid uh, understands marketing and, and branding and business and we could work with him even though we have nothing to do with like sports. You know, it, it, it's a matter of like the content that you put out into the world mm-hmm. is what the world is going to see you as. So when you're doing business kind of things, like you're going to be more known as a, as a business person as well as fantasy stuff. So it's like it's very practical to, to do a lot of this stuff if you're passionate about it. And you said kid just a minute ago. You are younger than a lot of people that are, you know, out there putting a brand together, but even with the fantasy football realm, like most of those guys and gals have been around for a little bit longer than you have. Um, <laughs> how, when you look at yourself and what you've been able to accomplish at the age that you are, are you ever, do you ever think, wow, like people my age don't do this stuff? Or are you, do you like, are, are you like people my age should do this stuff? Why aren't they doing this stuff? Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I think about it, I guess like I've, I've all the, all of those thoughts, less the, the former uh, of it. I, I do realize that like, I've probably done a lot of things that like 28 year olds don't do. I think when you're a little bit younger, you're kind of like, oh, you have all the time in the world. Like there, and also we live in a world where like you go on Instagram for five seconds and yeah. you see 10 people that are way younger than me, making way more money than me with way more followers than me that are way better. You know, like all of those fucking things kind of accumulate. And then before, before you know it, you're like, okay, I ain't shit again. You know what I mean? Like it just registers in your head, like very quickly. Uh, I, I would, I like, I, I want more people to do this stuff. It's like yeah. wildly freeing. And it's really like, I think everybody should have some kind of creative outlet, right? Like whatever's kind of natural to you. It's like, it's another reason why I want to bring my friends into it. It's another, I try to like talk, random people into like i'm like start a fucking podcast you're like oh i want to be uh I, I had a friend who's like i want to be a um i want to open my own practice in in uh in, in psychology or, or psychiatry or whatever you know one day i want to have my own practice i'm like how do you think you're going to get eyeballs on on you and and you being smart and you knowing the field well uh, in 10 years if you're not like providing this information with people like the world is going to change in 10 years the, the the people that are making the most money as like real estate agents right now is like lawyers you wouldn't think of it but it's the people that are doing the same thing that we're doing in fantasy football they're doing in their space but people are so used to used to like what has been happening for the previous 10 years that going back to like the practicality of this shit is so it's just very very real. So like, yes, I want people my age. I want people younger than me. I want people fucking older than me who are usually more apprehensive to do this stuff to do it because there's very real effects from it. What do you have to say to the people that want to do it, but they're like, I don't, I'm not going to be any good. I'm not going to do, I I have all these ideas in my head, but I just don't think that people are going to want to listen to what I have to say. Do you think that you gain a following, whether it's five or 500 or 5,000 or 5 million, and you should just try to appeal to your quote unquote fan base, or do you think like, Hey, maybe you're better suited, maybe writing or maybe like, you know, doing a different form of thing than being in front of a camera. Yeah. I mean, like you got, again, like you got to understand what, um, what you're good at. Like, I don't think everybody should be on YouTube. I don't think everybody should be podcasting. I don't think everybody should be writing. Some people can do all three. Some people can't do uh, You know, some people are good at one of them. I think it's mm-hmm. figuring out like what, which one you're, you're good at. And then figuring out like, not only, you know, like you might be a good writer. <clears throat> the problem is there's like, it's very hard to break out like blogging, but what you have to do is stay on top of the social platform. So you could be a good writer and you have to find like the platform that has a lot of organic reach and figure out where in there, like your writing skills will be useful and can make you grow a little bit. So like Instagram 
popped off for a little while where like the long written captions were like really popular and those got a lot of shares and views and like in the like nutrition space like oh i'm gonna write out my entire like day and inspiration and all this shit i'm like oh if you're a writer yes this is like a picture platform but that's where the growth is coming from so you got to keep your eyes open like what's natural to you what you're doing and also when you're starting off like it goes back to understanding that all the feelings that you're having are like wildly normal for everybody. Like I, yeah, for when sure. I started off, I'm just like, dude, like, I don't know if this shit is going to work out when you started. Like, I don't know if anyone's going to come on my podcast, if it's going to be any good. Everybody has those same feelings. They're shitty feelings to have, but you have to go through them. And once you learn from them, like you'll feel good. You'll look back and be like, yeah, of course I needed to go through those things to get to where I'm at. You also yeah. realize like it's all relative. Like your first five subscribers are going to feel just as good as my, when I hit 50,000 subscribers. Right. And like, it sounds ridiculous, but it's real when you're actually in the moment. And when I first started out doing this, yeah, that's kind of how it was. Like I, I started out writing and I still write, but I always question, are people actually writing or reading what I'm writing? Because it's easier to, to consume a podcast or, or a video than it is to sit down and, and read something. So I put a poll out and the poll came back that most people just skim the article. If it, if the player, you know, appeals to them because they have them on their fantasy team, then they're going to, you know, read that section, but they're not sitting there and reading the whole thing. But at the same time, I found out people were re reading my stuff when people would correct me and be like, actually this player, <laughs> you know, this, yeah, then you're yeah. Like, oh, I, uh, we're we're in such an interesting space yeah. because again people are attached to the whole blogging thing yeah realistically i i feel like not that blogging is a waste of time but in terms of like growth and in terms of like personal branding mm -hmm. really hard to grow right now within the space it's yeah. like you're writing for the fantasy footballers which does yeah. give you leverage because their their website on its own probably gets a ton of organic like seo coming to it plus you have like the leverage of you know a one or two of them retweeting some of your stuff sometimes and that will gain gain you a following but most people won't have that to bank on. Like if you're starting off a blog or whatever, yeah. the chances that people find your blog organically is mm -hmm. almost none. So I get people reach out and, uh, reaching out to me all the time. Like, yo, I'd love to just like blog for your website. And I'm like, I say no, but like not because you're not good enough, just because like you'd be wasting both of our time. Like one, I'm there. I'm not going to read your blog post too. It, you're not going to gain just because you're like attached to my YouTube channel yeah. and blogging for my site. Like it's not going to help you in the long run. So I think like thinking about shit like that is, is, is very underrated in, in the space. <clears throat> because you have such a following, do you think it's important to kind of like build people up and like share their stuff too? If you, if something is like really interesting to you, do you feel like putting it out there and helping like give them that bump is something worth doing? Yeah, hundred percent. I think like, I think that's so, I think that's so important. I think like, um, and that's what I'm trying to do with like the people on my team right now. I really want them to build their own. I want them to get to a point where they're like, they're coming at me and they have leverage. They're like, Nick, I'm this important to you that I need this from you. And I have no choice but to be like, fuck, you're right. Like <laughs> I, I'm not making this amount of money unless you're with me, or right. I'm not getting this many views unless you're on the podcast or shit like that. I think it, it's full circle. Obviously it comes back to intention. Like, of course I want to grow my friends and make sure that they have their own personal brand and they're gaining a lot of shit from it, but it, it works both ways when they're related to like, when they're attached to your brand and you're attached to them, it, it, I think it, creates a circle of, of just good that continues to kind of rise up. So yeah, I mean, if you see good work, like I, I don't, I don't know why people are hesitant to like point out things that they admire. Like I don't, right. I don't, I don't always do it like publicly. I don't, I don't like to retweet shit. Um, yeah. Normally it's not like something I, I would typically do, but I, if I have content creators that I like really admire, I think they're doing really good work. I almost always DM them and I'm like, dude, I just want to let you know, like I've been listening to your podcast all season. Um, your shit is like really good. I, I admire the work that you're doing. Uh, I just give them like a quick shout out. So I, like, I, I always try to acknowledge people that are doing uh, good because especially in our industry, it's, mm -hmm. it can be a big burnout, man. Like it's really hard to keep content up all off season through the yeah. end of the season. So uh, it's nice to get an acknowledgement and you know, it, it just, um, it, yeah, I think it's definitely really important to build people up. It really is like people like me who have 6,000 followers or whatever, like when somebody sends us a message, they're like, Hey, you know, I saw your, or I listened to your podcast or I read this article or whatever. And I, I really appreciate the work that you've, that you're putting out there. It makes you feel so freaking good when it's somebody that's like a bigger name guy that has a lot of followers or a bigger name girl that has a bunch of followers. You're like, holy crap. Like this person actually knows I exist. Yeah. Like you don't know the impact that that yeah. shit kind of has. Like I've had people reach out to me, like some pretty big fucking names from the interview series I did. And they're like, dude, you're doing a really good job with them. And I was like, I never in a million years would have thought that that person was watching or following or like cared about what I was doing. And I'm like, I'll always remember when that person did that. Like, so sending a fucking five word sentence to someone 
can change your entire perspective on that person. Like why, wh what does that take from you? Like, it's such a good thing. Oh my God. It is, you are helping so many people out by doing that. And just, you know, and every now and then somebody will be like, Hey, can you read my article and tell me what you think about it? I'm like, why do you want me to read? You know, like getting with the imposter syndrome, like, why do you want me to read it? That's a great mindset you know? to have. Like you keep that mindset as, as long as you possibly can. Cause I'm yeah. like, I'm kind of like a piece of shit now where I'm just like, I'm sorry. I don't, you know, like I don't, I, I want to help everybody, but like, I, yeah. I don't really have time. I have to try to prioritize things, but the longer that you can like really be in the grind and be in the grit with people like that. That's how you build like the really loyal following. Well, I straight up tell them, don't ask me for advice on Sundays because I'll be hung over and in bed till, oh, yeah. you know, until yeah. the game starts. So, uh, yeah, that was like so. key piece of my content every Sunday morning, like three, four years ago, I'd wake up, be hung over as shit, get on live streams, chop it up. And I'd be like, yeah, people stop asking. And there'd be like a thousand people in there, just a million six stars. I'm like, stop asking me fantasy football questions. Like yeah. I'm, I'm not here to have a good time. I'm here to be hung over. Just like hang out with me for a minute. And people like Loki love that, you know? No, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I have people DMing me and they're like, okay, I know you said last night that you were going to get trashed, but I have this question. I'm like, yeah, sorry, it's, I missed your question, but I was yeah. <laughs> not. It, it's funny when they reach out like that too, though, you know, cause you make an impression that way. They're like, oh, this girl's like cool. She's chill. Like it is yeah. what, it, you know, it, it's funny that way. It, it is part of life, you know? So yeah. that's that. But we're talking, speaking of alcohol, cause I touched on, um, margaritas earlier and i know you have a margarita tattoo and that's pretty dope uh, yeah. <laughs> i've got a question for you about margaritas what is the best margarita you've ever had oh uh the best margarita i've ever had might have been i've been to vegas one time okay it was actually for the fantasy sports like conference that they had last winter mm -hmm. uh went to there's a steakhouse there i want to say the name is stk STK Steakhouse. Uh, I, I think it's it, it's a pretty popular steak. I think they have one in New York, one in California. I don't know. Whatever. They, their margarita there was yep. fucking incredible. I might have been like kind of wasted already, so maybe like the score was a little higher based on that. I've always found that like I love margaritas when I'm already wasted, so it's probably a little bit of a cushion score. But <laughs> that that one sticks out to me like really really well. There's also a, a place in New York. Uh, down in like the Lower East Side called the Pineapple Club. They just opened up like pre-COVID and they make all of their drinks like freshly made. The shit is like marinating overnight. I don't know how you marinate a margarita, but everything was incredible and their their uh, their margarita was amazing. Sweet. Have yeah. you uh, ever gotten sick to a point off of margarita that you were like, I'm never going to have one again? Or, or are you one of those guys that's like, I'm a champ. I'm going to drink them. I know I'm not lying to myself. Um. I've never gotten to the point where like I'm never gonna drink them again, but like for the night I've cut myself off before. Sometimes if I get into like the frozen margaritas where I'm like I yeah. down a whole cup of a frozen marg, I'm like, this oh. is fucking a little bit too much. As I've gotten a little bit older too, like I can't strictly get drunk off of margaritas because drinking like eight of them will absolutely murder you yep. the next morning. You'll you'll wake up in a fucking coffin. So yep. um no, I don't think there'll ever be a point where I get like too I just like tequila is like easily my liquor of choice. So <laughs> I'll never be able to pivot off of that. I was going to ask you if you were a tequila fan. I can't do it. The last time I took a shot at tequila, I almost <laughs> threw up immediately. And it's just like <laughs> your brain goes back to a certain day. And you're like, I told myself I'd never do this again. <laughs> tequila is like, I love, I love loving tequila because it's yeah. like the drink where uh, a lot of people just don't like the shots of tequila. But it's one of those like fun drinks where you could always peer pressure people into taking yes. it. You're like, yep. you're not going to not take a shot at tequila. Like if it was like whiskey or yeah. something like hard, I'm just like, dude, I don't really like fuck with whiskey too much. But like tequila is like fun, like party mode. You're like, you're going to take the shot of tequila with me. And it works every time. I, yeah. I mean, it was my birthday. I think the last time that I took one, <laughs> <laughs> it was pre COVID. It was like right on that cusp. So we were out like well, your ass will be you. I bet you'll take some tequila shots when we're done with COVID. Like, I probably take a lot of shots when we're i've been taking a lot of shots now because yeah, of it, it won't be hard to convince people once we're done with covid to take oh it. no you know everybody's like i'm gonna save money now i don't go out i don't go to the bars and spend money but bitch you are buying alcohol <laughs> and bringing it home we have drizzly here i don't know if you guys have yeah, that yeah i'm like the guy doesn't even ask for id anymore he's like i've been to this house like three times Sweet. they just like drop it off in my apartment they never yeah. asked for an id to begin I with <laughs> I was doing the podcast last night and I was talking with some guy and I'm sure I say some guy. I was talking to my friend Troy, who's an up and coming guy in the fantasy football. Industry. Uh, yeah, I know of Troy. Yeah, he's a really rad guy. He's super nice. And so like I'm over here like, fuck, damn shit. You know? um, but yeah. I had a drizzly order coming like while I was talking to him and my wife was going to answer the door. But we have a sign down there that says don't ring the doorbell because of the dogs. 
So the guy's like texting me like 12 times about that. Drizz the yeah. order. I'm like, Troy, I'm listening to you. Fucking like, leave it outside. Yeah. I told him, I said, dude, just leave it. Like, you've been here. He's like, all right, fine. But you know, that's funny to me. Uh, but the margarita thing, yeah. I like it. That's part of your brand, though, right? People think when they hear margarita and fantasy football in the same sentence, you're the first person they think of, right? <laughs> I, I guess so. Yeah. I mean, I mean I, or like margaritas and fantasy football. I don't know, but <laughs> if there was one, it'd be you. I, I hope so. That's a, that's a brand I'd be very proud of. Yeah. So sure. I know another thing I have to bring up because I don't like, I already told you this before you came on that. I don't know as much about you as I probably should just because like people have brought you up on this podcast and I knew of you, but not, so much your content and then once i got into it i kind of got in like a hole you know you get in youtube holes <laughs> it's pretty easy to do with your stuff and i know you say um there's a word that you say bike. when yes spike welcome are you a bike. flies fan or welcome bike on? nah it's just like <laughs> some me and my friends used to say like a long time ago we've always said the word bike i don't know yeah. why and uh it means like back b-a-c-k yeah, right. like, to substitute for that and I just yep. started use the beginning of my videos. I would just be like, welcome bike, you know, and I'd start using it throughout. People are like, yeah. why the fuck is he saying bike? What does bike mean? And just, you know, and now you hear it. it it's yeah. more, it actually came from like hip hop culture. It was something yeah. that was like said in hip hop culture. And yeah. it was just like something me and my friends found funny. But like most people like Twitter is basically fantasy football. Twitter is like the opposite of hip hop culture. So people don't, yeah. they have no fucking idea what I'm talking about when I say things like that. So now when uh, it's getting a little bit more popular, the word bike, but like, yeah. When people like Bleacher Report used it in one of their tweets the other day, and I got mentioned in it like six thousand times, like yeah. Dude, they they stole it from you. I'm like, bro, I didn't I didn't create that shit. It's just like y'all just don't know anything about like culture, really, you know? Well, yeah, I I told my wife it was so funny. I was like, hey, I'm gonna be interviewing this guy who says bike a lot, right? And I don't really know why he does. And so she, <laughs> I'm gonna Google it. So she Googled it and she's like, oh, hip hop. And I was like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's just really funny to have my wife tell me, oh yeah, hip hop. Like, how do you know more than me? Like, Google, Google is the end all be all of finding things. So yeah, it's just like a <laughs> stupid fucking word that I say all the oh, time. It's and like I your brand now too. That's another thing, right? It's something that sticks out and people know you. I, I see people that are commenting on your like either tweeting to you or like on your youtube and stuff and they use it yeah so, like, <laughs> we're, we're, so, we're so bike yeah i love that i fucking that, it's that, so that, dope that, because like you know, footballers have like 55 and stuff i know that when you were interviewing them you brought that up and and like it's really cool that if you have a catchphrase that people can kind of grasp onto I guess yeah it's got to be like natural too when you start yeah. trying to force that shit it's it's like kind of awkward and weird but if yeah. If it's something that's natural that just happens over a long period of time, like yeah. that will become part of, you know, what you're doing and, and your brand, I guess. Oh, and I was telling my wife too, I was like, I don't think I could remember to like change the word out when I'm talking <laughs> you say it just so naturally. I'm Mike, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, talent right there. There's your hidden talent. <laughs> so um, before we close it up, I just want to talk a little bit about like personal life versus like being in the fantasy football industry. How do you find time to balance like your personal life and the work that you have to do as well? Um, yeah, I mean, definitely when I started this, it was, it was difficult. There were definitely sacrifices I had to make. Like, you know, I was like, I wanted to wake up Saturday and Sunday sometimes, and I needed to have my mind straight. I needed to make sure I wasn't hung over. I didn't need to stay out late. I needed to sleep. And uh, there are personal sacrifices you need to make. Like there are, there are legitimately like relationships that I haven't been able to get into or had to like end because yeah. I just, I, I am very focused and I put my energy towards uh, the, the goals that I'm chasing after right now. Mm -hmm. And I just, I can't like promise that to another person or anyone else because this is what I'm committed to right now. So I would say it's a lot of sacrifice, but I've gotten better as I've grown a little bit and and i think like outsourcing has been one of the, the key things to my friends that help me with content and to the editors that help me with this video stuff you know outsourcing to them is, is not always is not always like i, I again I'm, I'm fortunate to have been able to uh create this 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 mixture of my personal life and my work life kind of together sometimes like when i outsource stuff for what people would consider my work which i consider everything in my life uh, like if I'm like, I need you to start editing these videos. It's not always because like, I need to spend that hour emailing fucking business executives or whatever it is. Sometimes it's just like, I need that hour to like relax or recharge. Sometimes I need that hour to go out with my friends and grab a drink or go on a date or like do X, Y, or Z. So I've been able to outsource things and also like not really judge myself on what I do to keep my energy up. Like what I, what I do in my personal life, I understand reflects back to my bike 
to my business life. You know? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> we'll All see if we'll we'll see if we'll, um, yes, but that, I mean, I get that. And and I talked to people and it prior to even this podcast, just one of the reasons I think I started this podcast was to kind of help people out with like balancing their family life and, and being a part of the fantasy industry because it is grueling and it does, it is time consuming. And there are people that have families with, lots of kids and this, that, and the other. And I'm like, how you're on a podcast every yeah. day. I don't, don't, don't get it fucking twisted. It, it's a lot of work. Like yeah. when you're starting off, here's the thing. Like you actually have to work as if you know, whatever your goal is, if you want this shit to be your full-time thing, you're, you can't work half time expecting it to become a full-time thing. Like you need to be working just as hard as the people that are working at it full time before it's your full-time thing. Like it, and it, you can't like make it into a fairy tale. Like that's the, that's the practicality of it. So when I started this shit, like, yeah, I was working 12, 13, 14 hours a day on this stuff. And like my fucking eyes hurt at the end of the day, because I was looking at my computer screen all day. You have to find ways to cope with that or push through that and, and understand it's not forever, but it is a part of doing it in today's world. And you could find shortcuts and that's where being savvy in social and being savvy in like marketing and branding yourself becomes important because it's less time you have to spend doing those 12 hour days and shit like that. It's dope. Yes. Great advice. I, I'm still trying to learn how, how to balance stuff and I, I don't do this full time at all, but you know, just life in general comes at you real fast. Fair speed. Yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, like, <laughs> like, listen, it's, 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 it's different for everybody. It's, it's really dependent on, on, on what your goal is. Some people just do this for an outlet. Some people do it for fun. Some people do it because it's truly their passion and it's a way to get away from the shit that they hate in their, in their regular work. And that's cool. If that's like the, all the outlet you need, perfect. Like don't, don't overwork yourself on something that you love because then mm -hmm. you're going to start hating it. And it's like, fuck now I need an outlet from the outlet I had originally. But if you're in this for like the long haul, understand that you've got to have short-term sacrifices in order to like achieve the long-term stuff. Yep. <laughs> I agree. Um, speaking of something fun, because you were talking about fun, I, I've watched one of the videos. I watched the draft, the live draft that you had from 2019, where you had all the homies come, you know, to the Airbnb and you guys did all that. Yeah. Like how dope was that? And then what kind of advice do you have for people who want to like do something like that once all this pandemic stuff goes away but they like want to have a live draft like that they want to bring people in from all over the place yeah that that was pretty fucking wild actually that's probably one of the things if not the thing i'm most proud about that we've done as a brand mm -hmm. um for anyone listening like basically it was just we had 10 or 11 of our of my subscribers on youtube fly out from all over the country we had like dudes california fucking texas minnesota all over the place and we got an airbnb in new york city we chilled for the weekend we had our fantasy draft on like the Saturday and the rest of the time was just like spent hanging out, getting to know each other, going out, partying, doing a lot of shit. Um, that was really difficult <laughs> to plan <laughs> to get the logistics behind the first year. We So that was the second year we did it. I think the probably the one that you watched was the second year. We've done it two years. Yeah. The first year was really fucking hard because I had no idea how to plan it. I had no idea like. I need to make sure like the dudes that were coming weren't like super weird and that like it would make for a right. good weekend, you know, like I need to have people that I could get along with so that I wouldn't have to worry about a bunch of like nonsense going on. I think like live events are fucking super cool. One, you. you know, you get to meet the people that are following you the closest because the people that are going to come to those live events, people that are going to pay to fly out and pay for that entirety of the weekend are the people that like love you the most, you know, like that's cool to fucking meet them too. Like we're able to make it into a, awesome piece of content that again portrays the lifestyle part of of what we're building like you get to know me better getting a video of like us hanging out for the weekend you feel yeah. like again like you know the person like you're friends with the person so um very hard live events are really 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 underrated both from a content sen uh, sense uh, uh, like a brand sense but also underrated in terms of like how hard it is to make it happen uh i would say for people looking to do that that's where brand comes into play. Like you need to have a really fucking passionate, loyal following in order for people to want to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's like a gut feeling. It's like, do like, do you know that the people that follow you like really love you? Can you pull that shit off? And I almost, I almost held it off for like another year. I was scared to do it. I was like, what if people don't sign? Like back to the imposter. Like, what if I don't get enough people that want to do the league or mm -hmm. sign up for it? And one of my friends was like, dude, shut, it's like, sh shut the fuck up and you're going to do it this year and it's going to be good. And then you're going to continue doing it. And we did it that year, the first year. 
Mm. Tons of problems with like fucking people waking up all over New York City. We had fucking puke. Air. Like it was non. It was nonsense. It was yeah. A lot of the shit we left off camera that like you would imagine what would probably happen that weekend. But for the most part, so fucking cool and something I'm really proud of because nobody else in the space does that shit. And I really think like with that piece of content, we can make that into one of like the more exclusive fantasy leagues in you know on the internet. Like I think people are gonna be like, yo, this is fucking really cool that he brings the subscribers together for this and it's a piece of content that gets a shitload of views so it's like it's popular and it's engaging and it's very relatable really in a sense that's so cool i like watching that i just felt like man i wish i could do something like that that's so dope and, and i totally get the whole getting drunk in new york and ending up somewhere you're like don't well, know. yeah also also like i have to caveat by saying like that's also that, that was also like my lifestyle, like being yeah. drunk in Manhattan for like a full weekend from the ages of like 22 to 24. So it wasn't very difficult for me to like plan that and be like, this is what's going to happen. Cause I, I've already done that exact weekend with my friends, like yeah. two dozen thousand times, you know? Sure. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's going back to like what value you provide. Like, I'm just like, this is me. I'll be able to show them a good time. And that's great. And some people yeah. would be like, I want to do a retreat. That's like based around fitness or you know right. we're gonna have a good weekend where we like clear our minds it's like a meditation thing yeah. that could also be fantasy football but it goes back to like what you the connection that you have with your audience you know and that's cool uh, yeah because i know people that fly out to vegas to do live drafts and people that go camping and people who do this and do that and so super rad and you were talking earlier about going to that conference in vegas how was it being around people that like maybe you looked up to or people that just have like a business mindset that you kind of maybe not model yourself after, but people that you like respect in the industry. Yeah, it, it was, it was pretty, it was pretty wild being there. Uh, I, I will say though, I didn't actually go to the conference. Like yeah. I had been, the season ended and I was like, I kind of need to like get out of where I was. I was like, I need to travel a little bit. I'm so burnt out from the season. Mm -hmm. So me and my friends were kind of like traveling. Uh, I went to like Florida first and then we were in, um, New Orleans for the national championship game. Oh. And then we went to Vegas. I, do, I just went for one night because I only actually went because um, one of the companies I work with was like there. And they're like, if you're going to the conference, like I'll meet you. And I was like, oh, I'm already kind of traveling. So like, I'll just go there for a night. And it happened to be the night that they were doing the conference. So I got there and uh, like, I wasn't really allowed in the conference because I wasn't an attendee of the conference. Mm -hmm. uh, but like the, the footballer, Andy was there and I was like, yo, just come like lift the curtain for me real quick so I could like slide right in. And of course he did that. So <laughs> like, really cool to hang out with them and meet some of the dudes that I just only interact with from like Twitter uh, yeah. Twitter and stuff. But again, like I, it, it's not like always my like cup of tea there. Like I don't, I, I don't know like how much I, re I really relate to I, I shouldn't even say that because I had a great fucking time. Like I met a lot of awesome, awesome people there that like I never would have thought I'd be like cool hanging out with. And like, you know, I, I took tequila shots with like Brad Evans while we were there. And like hey. I met a bunch of people that I otherwise wouldn't have networked with. Um, so, yeah, it was it's was, it was pretty wild meeting people. Like I, I was right next to like Matt Berry at the bar. I was uh, like, this is this is fucking weird, but also crazy and, and cool. So <laughs> it, it, yeah, it, it's, it's kind of like a surreal experience in a sense. That's dope. I went to the Dallas fantasy football convention that they had going on back in the day when it was a actual thing. And uh, yeah, I met the footballers there. Brad Evans, we both missed our Scott Fishbowl pick because we both <laughs> got intoxicated that night in different places. So then, um, Liz Loves is like one of my really good friends and I met her there. Like that shit is oh, yeah. so cool to like network like that too. Like what, what's the importance of networking? What do you think like being able to have other people in the same industry that kind of have your back and vice versa and you can, you know, jump on with them. They can jump on with you or help each other out. All that. Yeah. Stuff. I, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's important depending i think on on like what you're i guess trying to do like it's not a bad again like i look at this a little differently um depending on like where you're trying to go in the industry if you're if your goal is to like grow and you want appearances on different podcasts and stuff of course it's always going to be important networking i i like the networking portion of it because i get to talk about uh like growing a business in this space with people who have already done it and have more experience than me and can give me advice um, so yeah, I mean, networking is, of course, it's important in every aspect of life, but depending on how you tailor it to yourself, it's, um, it's going to be kind of different in this industry. And talking about tailoring things to yourself, if you are the type of person that wants to grow your brand and you want to have, you know, a following and have, I see it all the time. People either 
asking, you know, I need to get to 5,000 followers. I want to get to 6,000, 7,000 followers. And then other people that are like, I don't really care about my follower count, but, but they want to grow their brand and they want to be big and stuff. Do you think follower count does matter? Or do you think it's something that you shouldn't really pay attention to? Uh, as much as I want to say and be like non-materialistic, like, yeah, that shit doesn't matter. It does matter because it moves the needle for certain things. Like it gives you uh, a level of authority when you're trying to get things done. It gives you a level of like credibility. But I also think if like doing the right things are what and like end up getting you to those numbers, you know what I mean? It's not like I feel like the people that do end up getting to the subscriber kinds that you're trying to get to don't get there because they're trying to, right? Like right. those things will take take you there. So I think like really good intent will always be the place that gets you there. But we're all like human. Like I'm always looking at the next goal when it comes to like numbers and subscribers, but I know I'm going to get there not because I want to get to a certain number of subscribers, but because I'm doing X, Y, Z and I'm doing them the right way and I'm working hard in order to get there. So it's like following and looking at the numbers, it's pointless because when you get there, it doesn't actually fucking do anything for you. But it's more so like a... It's more so like a, a good teller to yourself. Like, okay, I am, it's like an acceptance of the market in a sense. So do you go back at your videos and like, look at the statistics from them? Like what got the most views? What was this? What was that? And kind of tailor what you're going to put out based on what does well and what doesn't hit? Uh, rarely I will. I I've done it a little bit more just because I've noticed like some videos will do really astronomically high numbers compared to like the the average things so i'm like okay i need to make sure that i do like these three videos in the summer at this time but typically again like i'm not a very um analytical person when it comes to like tactics like that i just again like trying to do what i feel is right at the time that i feel it's right to do it um but like i'll i'll once in a while i'll look back and be like okay we need to do this and this and this at this time but that's that's never like the driving force and when you do something like a podcast or whatever, what is the importance of people actually rating and reviewing those podcasts? Because I know that people just listen and a lot of the times they don't do that. Yeah, that's like, I don't know. Like, I don't, I don't really know. I just know like we're supposed to fucking say it. And like, obviously, <laughs> obviously the more ratings you have, the more reviews you have, the more thumbs up you got on YouTube. Like, I assume that like more thumbs up means the more people that they're going to show the video to, right? Like it says that like, okay, the average YouTube viewer in fantasy football likes this video. Let's show it to uh, more people that haven't seen it yet. So I would assume there's a level of engagement, but like, you know, these, these platforms, YouTube and, and Apple and whatever, uh, they just hide these things very well. So like, we're never really going to know. We just assume that like positive engagement is positive engagement. And there's not really much you can do to kind of, to game the system in that sense. I always, I hate, like, I really, really am avidly against people doing like, oh, we're doing a giveaway. Like, <laughs> like I, you know, we're going to give away a hat for if you tag three people, follow these three accounts and like retweet all our shit. I'm like, that's fine. But like, I deep down, I'm like, I, 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 I hate that. I, I, I just straight up, I just fucking hate like gimmicky shit like that. Yeah. I do a pizza thing <laughs> for a follower account, but like, I don't keep up with it or anything. I'm like, when I get to a start, I bought a pizza for somebody one time, but I, it was right when COVID started and I was like, you know what? I actually want to help like delivery drivers and shit out. So no, was, that, that's like fucking cool. Like I think every once in a while it plays, especially like if it's on brand, like something like that, but like yeah. people do that. At, that's like their main form of like trying to grow. Like that's, that's their plan, you know? And I'm like, that's such a faulty way of, of thinking about things, you know? No, for sure. I get that. And, and you might get somebody to scribe, subscribe to your YouTube or your podcast or whatever, but are they going to continue to listen? And Chances exactly. are, not, you know. Yeah, it, those are that. Those are so like those kind of contests and things like that. They're they're empty. Like it's cool to see, you know, eight thousand retweets on on a single tweet, but like eight thousand retweets equal what? One follower, one dollar. Like what, what? What? What's your goal there? You know? Yeah, you don't really. <laughs> yeah, and I can see where people <clears throat> come from when they do that. Like you know, trying to engage it. And some people do stick around because they're like, oh, that's cool. You guys do contests. You guys do this. You guys do that. If it's on your brand, then yeah, sure. If, you, if that's yeah. your thing and you're doing it out of the kindness of your heart and not trying to get personal gain because of it, then that's dope. But I'm not going to go spend money on a jersey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a time and place for everything. It just, that's just like one of the things in, in our industry. I notice like all the time is like a main trying to grow your shit. I'm just like, that's uh, I hate it. You know? Yeah. I get that. I'm so happy that you came on with me because 
like I said, people were bringing you up like crazy on here. Like the second episode of this podcast, my homie Gabe was on it and we were talking brand like constantly the whole entire thing. And I was like, I should just title this episode brand. And it's like, well, if you do that, you have to credit Nick. And I was like, who? And then, so then I was like, I gotta go look this dude up and like really get to know what he's about. So like you encompass everything that I want this podcast to be about. And I know that you had a podcast similar to this. Matt, uh, Matt Harmon has had something with Backyard Banter. I just think it's really important to get the word out to people that are up and coming that like they can do it. 100%. Man, they can, they, do, they can do it. Look at that. We have such a wide variety of people doing it. Sure. Like there's, there's no yeah. excuse not to do it. We all, you all got to fucking work hard. That's really what it comes down to. Have good intent, work really fucking hard, and, and be smart about how you're working. I really appreciate you coming on. Like, first, this was like my Brad Evans moment where I'm like, oh my God, I need a fangirl, fangirl. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, before we go, can you just let everybody know, like, where they can find your stuff, what you got going on, and all that jazz? Yeah. Uh, you could find me on YouTube. It's just my name, Nick Ercolano, uh, E R C O L A N O, uh, on Twitter. If you want to come yell at me, don't ask me any sit start questions. Actually, by the time y'all probably <laughs> listen to this, sit yeah. starts will be out of the way. Yeah. Uh, at Nick underscore B D G E. Uh, so Twitter and YouTube are, are pretty much my my things, and that's where I'll be kind of keeping you all up to date with everything uh, throughout the offseason. Super rad, super rad. You guys go check his stuff out, and we will be back next week. I hope you guys have a great whatever month, whatever day, whatever year this is. Have fun <laughs> whenever you're listening. Evergreen content. Adios.